Hello and welcome back to Making the Argument. We have a episode today which is going to be dedicated to a couple of our members from the community chat, Chris and Joshua. Um, they asked an interesting question, and that is we, we've talked a lot about the internal turmoil within the United States, but how does the rest of the world react? Like what happens on a global level if the United States is so inundated with infighting with, you know, questions about national divorce or with just open civil war. Like what would happen to the entire global situation if the United States was not able to intervene financially or militarily the way we have for the past, what, 100 years? So we decided to open that up. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go through and we're going to ask questions like, what would China do? What would Russia do? What would Iran or the Middle East do? What would the European Union do? Or here's a question. What would our neighbors, Mexico and Canada, do if the United States was so immersed in an internal conflict that we couldn't project the power we normally do? All of that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument. And I want to encourage everyone to go ahead and look in the show notes, go into our community chat. Like I said, this whole episode today was inspired by two different people from our community asking us to tackle this question. So that's what we're going to do. So go over there, give that a look and see if you might be interested in joining. Also, if you enjoy the program that we provide, maybe like, maybe subscribe. We certainly appreciate people watching, but it also helps if you choose to do those two things as well. As always, I am your host, Nick Freitas, with me in the studio, my beautiful bride, Tina, Queen of the Bees. Hello, everyone. And we also have our resident historian and political prognosticator, Christian Hines. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well. All right. So we're going to go ahead and uh, jump right into this. Let me go ahead and lay the groundwork because there's a, a thousand different scenarios that you could use. We, we've talked a lot about this whole concept of national divorce or internal struggle within the United States, right? What are the, what are the conditions that would be necessary? What are the catalysts that would be necessary? But we don't want to get into the weeds of that, right? We want to assume that in, for the purposes of answering this question, a lot of these things have already happened. And now we're going to focus primarily on the international response. Like one of the questions is what, when any of these countries that we just mentioned, would they intervene in, in a fight within the United States? Right. That's an interesting thing to, to consider. So let me go ahead and lay the groundwork here. Right. So these are, these are the conditions. These are the scenarios that we're assuming have already taken place. And it's through that lens that we're going to consider these other options. So number one, we're going we're gonna to assume that the United States has had some sort of major catalyst. Maybe it was a sovereign debt crisis. Maybe it was um, you know, stacking the Supreme Court. And now states have decided to, to really push back against the federal government. But here's a couple of things that we're, we're going to assume. One, we're going to assume there's two major factions that are fighting with one another. Right. And they're not not trying to secede, not trying to peacefully leave, that they're actually fighting with one another for control of the federal government. So we can assume that there was a contested election. We can assume that significant portions of the country disagree about the results. Uh, but we're going to assume that if you if you look at kind of the ideological lines in the country, you're probably going to see um, a lot of a lot of states within the south, within the Midwest, um, in, in certain northern portions of the country that have probably allied with one another. And then you're largely going to see the, the West Coast, right, siding on the other side with probably like New England, uh, New York. And then, and then you're always going to have some states for which there's, there's a lot of division, right? Michigan, Pennsylvania, um, Colorado. These, these are all states that would be kind of in a precarious position where you don't see necessarily contiguous lines uh, geographically. Um, obviously there's also going to be a, a big urban rural divide, but for the purpose of this conversation, we're going to assume that people have kind of geographically self-sorted at this, at this point. So, um, so there is kind of this, you know, again, two major factions, um, that are, that are competing for control over the United States government. And that's what, again, largely prevents the United States government from being able to focus outward. And now it's entirely focused inward. A couple other things that we're going to suggest right now. One is, we're going to say that the military split, right? So it's not as if the military has entirely sided with one faction or the other, right? So there, there's a divide there that's going on, which again, also ensures that one side is not completely dominating this fight, right? Um, another thing we're going to say is like neither side is using nukes, right? So we're not talking about any like, you know, doomsday scenarios where nukes are going off in New York or Los Angeles or Dallas or anything like that, right? We, we have something of... Um, kind of a, a rigid stalemate right now where both sides have economic power, both sides have military power, both sides are, are you know, fighting for, again, control of the federal government, uh, but neither side has achieved complete dominance, right? 
<clears throat> in the backdrop of all of that, right? So now you're you're kind of imagining the scenario on which states are kind of where and, and what fighting might be going on. Um, but the the primary thing to keep into consideration is that because of all that internal turmoil, carrier battle groups are not deploying to the Mediterranean to deal with the conflict in the Middle East, right? Billions, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in military equipment and cash is not being shipped off to Ukraine, right? There is no more guarantee that U.S. military power of the Pacific Fleet is going to show up to support Taiwan, right? So these are all the considerations that we're now going to dive into as kind of a fun thought experiment on what would that look like? Because let's face it, regardless of whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, United States economic and military dominance means that we are the only global hegemon in the world. Yes, China's powerful. Yes, Russia's got nukes. Yes, the European Union uh, has massive economic potential and capability. But none of them, none of them possess the ability to project power the way the United States does and that has been the reality ever since the close of World War II, right? At the height of the Cold War, you could say, okay, but there, there was the Soviet Union. Yes, sure. And then especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, the U.S. was it. And, and yes, China has been growing economically and militarily, but they're also facing a major crisis right now because it's as bad as it is economically in the United States right now in, in certain respects. It is far worse in China. China is facing population collapse where they're going to lose upwards of, if things maintain at the same rates, they're going to lose upwards of 700 million people by the turn of the century, right? They, they have a huge housing bubble in China. They have massive monetary problems. But again, if the United States is not there to project power, what happens? So with, with laying, that, laying that groundwork, so we're all kind of on the same sheet of music of what's, what's going on in the world right now, the first question that we're going to ask is, what does China do, right? What does China do? And, I mean, obviously, I think most people would say right off the bat, oh, well, they take Taiwan. Like, they, they, they are definitely taking Taiwan. But as we've mentioned before, that's a major logistical nightmare, well, I have a question before we even get to yeah. what they would do militarily. Right now, um, China depends very heavily on shipping goods to other countries in order to sell them. Um, would we be in some kind of a trade situation with China at that point, or would sh trade probably be shut down? I don't think trade Because would if we stop trading with China and and other countries or whatnot, then, then it does seem like... Uh, that would hit them pretty hard as well. And then um, also we wouldn't be sending foreign aid to everybody anymore. That's all shut down. So so I, I feel like before we even get to who's attacking who militarily, I'm, I'm looking at how many of these countries would be reeling from the financial impact oh, it would be, of look, losing billions of dollars or trillions of dollars. Yeah, it, it would be significant. The United States is, is the larger importer of, of foreign goods in the world. We're the largest economy. Um, and, and so I, I don't think trade would completely stop. I don't think that would happen, right? And in fact, you could even argue that if the, if the United States is engaged in a full-blown, like, shooting civil war, then there's going to be reduced manufacturing, you know, capacity for consumer goods. Um, and, and there may be certain things that we develop domestically more. You're going to see certain industries which shift from a, a consumer goods footing over to a military footing. Like a perfect example of this is when we needed more, like World War II, you had a lot of industries like Singer sewing machines, right? They stopped making as many sewing machines and they, they started making weapons. And you could see the same thing where there's an easy transition from a consumer good um, market to a munitions market or a weapons market, you'll see a lot of domestic industries shift to that in order to, to fill that up. Um, but that doesn't mean complete demand for consumer goods is, is shutting down. And so you, you would still see, like would, would California, for instance, completely shut off trade with China? No, I, I, don't, I don't think well, that would happen. I, I do think that um, maintaining ports and maintaining you know, everything at sea, uh, it seems to me that the seas would become very, very dangerous if we were at war uh, with ourselves. Because, you know, right now we have U.S. Coast Guard, we have all these different ports and, and everything runs kind of like a well-oiled machine all around our, our you know, yeah, we're, we're not worried about major, you know, attacks on our ports at this point. So you don't think that um, that our footing is too weak to continue doing that type of trade? 
Well, no, I, I think what it is is both sides would both sides would deploy military forces in order. So, like for instance, you know, uh, Charleston Harbor, right, or or different ports in in Florida or Texas, and then on the other side, you know, New York and and Los Angeles or San Francisco. Now, are these going to be potential targets for one side or the other? Absolutely, but you're also going to see resources deployed in order to protect those because they're economically vital, and right. and so. But yeah. I do think, you know, some of the ports in the South, um, you know, would be probably heavily uh, defended by one side or the other. And then you would have ports like in San Francisco, which would be heavily defended by well, that's what the I was just other saying. side, right? Yeah. So my question is, wouldn't we be bombing each other's ports? Yeah. <laughs> if, 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 yeah. You can, if you can get to it. I mean... Yeah. The, the the problem is is that there's too many targets yeah right and and there's not enough people because yes we have 330 million Americans but it's not as if all 330 million Americans are going to be picking up arms and fighting each other it, it, in well, actual if we civil have a bridge collapse like we just saw in Maryland um, and how easily that bridge collapsed how many different areas where there's some a major obstruction if you were to take it out, you know, how many bridge bridges would one side or the other be blowing up in order to block their port? Well, well yeah, you would have, you would have, you would definitely have reduced trade capacity. There's no mm -hmm. question, but you have like major ports in like Norfolk, Virginia and, and, um, Charleston and Savannah and things like that. Not, not to mention the fact that where there is a will, there is a way. And so obviously you're going to deploy, you're going to deploy forces to protect areas of strategic interest, just like you're, the other side is going to, you know, try to attack those. Now in a civil war, it gets a little bit different, right? Because you're actually destroying territory that you want to maintain, right? Because again, the scenario we said here is like both sides want to, con they, they want to win control of the United States. They're not just trying to secede or, or break off. They're trying to win control. And so there is damage to be done to your own side. If you can, if you can win without destroying those ports, you would, you would prefer to do so. Yeah. But I do think there are some places that are so heavily entrenched by the other side, like by the, Within woke, the leftist, whatnot, you know, you've got areas like Seattle, you've got San Francisco, you've got various areas where, um, half the country's already written those places off and we're not even at civil war. <laughs> okay. But here's what I would also say is that it, it, part of what we're looking at right now, like with this bridge in, in Delaware, we're looking at that through the scenario of we're, we're not involved. It was in, uh, it was in Maryland. Sorry, Maryland. sorry, Maryland, Maryland. We're, we're not looking at this with respect to, um, a, a wartime footing. So for instance, if, if we wanted to build an aircraft carrier today, or if we wanted to do major repairs on a, on an aircraft carrier that had been heavily damaged today, Oh yeah, six months, a year, two years, whatever it is. In World War II, we were doing turnarounds like within weeks. Mm -hmm. um, it, it turns out when you're when you're on a war footing, you're not sitting there negotiating union contracts, right? You're you're getting things done because it's an existential threat, and, and that that changes drastically the way people look at rules, laws, regulations, risk associated. So if you're if you're someone that, for instance, you're heavily dependent upon U.S consumer purchasing power, right? Um, you're still going to find a way to trade with the United States. It might be, or you're going to find a way to trade with different groups that want to trade with you. So it might be that you don't drop off your, you don't go right into Los Angeles Harbor. If you consider it too much of a threat, you go over to British Columbia, right? And you, and you drop it in Canada, which is probably playing the role of a, a neutral power. And then you ship your goods in that way, or you offload it from a major ship onto smaller ones. And then that gets it to where it needs to go. So it, it again, it's amazing how um, you know, ingenuity really comes into play when you, when you need the supplies and when there's money to be made in providing them and distributing them. Right. And so you, you would see things become more expensive for sure, because there's so much more that's necessary to either protect the, the ports of entry or in order to like break it down into smaller loads to be able to get it where it needs to go. But you would still see trade taking place. Yeah. yeah and I think that we would also see all infrastructure, uh, type of spending come to a screeching halt because at that point you're not working on infrastructure. You're working on staying alive. Well, you're you know? not working on new. And so again, yeah, the whole scenario infrastructure is takes up massive parts of every state budget. Yeah. But at this point, what it would be is you'd, you'd be maintaining the infrastructure. So it's not that you wouldn't have spending on infrastructure. It would be about maintaining what you currently, you'd be about maintaining vital supply lines. Right. So you wouldn't be worried about necessarily the same things we're worried about now. So it would, 
you know, like alleviating traffic on Route 66 or whatever it is. No, it would. Well, again, it would all be it would all yeah. be focused on it would all be focused on on the logistics necessary to keep the economy running and to keep military operations in the field. There, there's a there's a saying within the military where it's, you know, um, you know, great commanders think in terms of logistics, you know, mediocre commanders think in terms of, of tactics or strategy. And that's because if you can't supply your troops, it doesn't matter how good your flanking plan was, right? It, if they're, if they don't have bullets or they don't have food, you're done. And, and so that, that would be the, the, the main focus within, you know, both factions within the United States is how do you maintain critical infrastructure and, and critical uh, key terrain in, in order to, you know, again, fund your troops, supply your troops. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I mean, trade would certainly continue, especially with a country like China, which I mean, we do an incredible amount of trade with, but keep in mind the the way that, that a division would likely take place is that the vast majority, if not all of the Pacific coast would be held by one side. Yeah. And so trade with China would be pretty difficult for team red to engage in because Team Red's ports would mostly be in the South. Well, I think what you would see is you would probably see, again, China wants to make money off of this. Like, so again, back to China, right? China being a major trading power and what is China's interest in this? Well, I, I, I think China actually benefits obviously from the United States not being able to project power and potentially becoming far more dependent on, on Chinese manufacturing for consumer goods along with military goods and everything else. If China wants to trade to, you know, you know, Team Blue, yeah, they, they either go into Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Vancouver. If they want to trade with Team Red, they go through the Panama Canal and they end up in Galveston, um, assuming the Panama Canal is still in operation, which I think it would be. I don't think either side would, would try to, like, take out the Panama Canal. Oh, I think Team Blue would if the Chinese are trading with Team Red. I, I, I don't. I, 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 think it would be, I, I think it would be difficult to do, and I think they would end up making an enemy out of out of China, which is not something that they would want to do. Oh, I thought you were about to say Panama, and I was about no. to say, I'm sure they're willing to take that bet. I think uh, yeah. since you mentioned Panama, and of course the new Panamanian president talking about shutting down his border to keep things come from, people from coming up through, uh, that brings me to a question about immigration. Well, wait a second. I, I want to get to that, but okay. that's actually further down the list of points. Okay. So like the first one we're going to hit on is China. So the, the, the trade component is, makes a lot of sense because it, it affects a lot of things. Um, again, I think a lot of people have this assumption that, okay, which countries are going to align with Team Blue versus Team Red or, or things like that. And my personal opinion is that if, if you're China, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm selling weapons and consumer goods to Team Blue and Team Red because I'm dealing with my own financial crisis in, in China. Because again, if you have the world's reserve currency, which is no longer the world's reserve currency, that that has a lot of economic upheaval across the globe, and then I, I'm also I'm looking at China from the, the perspective of you're not invading the United States, right? You're not you're not loading up a million troops on transport ships and and marching them across the Pacific to get involved in in a fight in the United States, but you are settling scores with Taiwan. You are potentially settling scores with. South Korea or Japan, you are potentially expanding into, you know, Mongolia or, or parts of, of Siberia that, you know, historically at one point belonged to China and that China is still a little bitter about. You may be going up to get Lake Bacall because that's your fresh water and that's part of, of Russia right now. Um, or you might be aligning yourself with with Russia and, and not invading Russia, but focusing on, you know, your Belt and Road initiatives and you're, you're looking at there's a trillion dollars worth of rare earth minerals sitting in Afghanistan. Um, and if you're not contending with the U.S., the Spratly Islands that, that China has, you know, laid a claim on uh, for potential offshore oil, if you're China, that's I think that's where your focus is. There's there's definitely scores to be settled with a lot of China's neighbors. China has very few neighbors that they're actually friendly with. Yeah. If you think about it, Mongolia and Russia are in North Korea are where it begins and ends. Yeah. China. Well, I mean, Russia historically is not a. Yeah, but but recently the two have have you know come much closer because together. of strategic necessities and convenience. And, and I I actually think that this kind of gets me into um, an area of disagreement that I know that you and I have here because I actually think that China would pick a side. And it it sounds crazy, but hear me out. I I think China supports Team Red, and the reason why is not because they have any love for Team Red, but because they have a visceral level of hatred for Team Blue. And the only reason they have a visceral level of hatred for Team Blue is because they view Team Blue as being the new neocons. 
if this was the 1980s, they'd be on Team Blue, yeah. right? Because Team Red were the were the neoconservatives. But wait, you're gonna have to explain why Team Blue are considered neoconservatives in China's view. Because the underpinning the, the, aspect, not neocon ideologically, but with foreign policy, interventionist foreign policy. Yeah. They're not conservatives. They're not even mm -hmm. neoconservatives, but they are interventionists. There's a reason why. I mean, look, look at the look at the vote for the giant. What was it like? Hundred billion dollar foreign aid package that took place a few weeks ago. A majority of Republicans in the House voted against it, and. 90 plus percent of Democrats voted for it. It's yeah. Democrats that are changing their Facebook and Twitter profiles to Ukrainian flags. Yeah. It's Democrats that talk about how we need to keep shipping weapons and aid and and everything to Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan. Well, not, not necessarily Israel. Well, Israel, they're divided on. It, it, well, and, but, but Elizabeth but, Warren, who doesn't want weapons going to Israel, but what does she want? A ma she even said in a tweet, massive foreign aid is what Gaza needs at this point. Yeah, so they're, they're yeah. all about foreign aid. Now, yeah. they, they, they have internal fights. Israel's actually a good example of this. But outside of Israel, and that's all because of the whole oppressed-oppressor dynamic with you know yeah. cultural Marxism. But outside of that, like they're totally on board with supporting Taiwan because Taiwan actually— Ta the, the, the secret that a lot of Americans don't know is Taiwan's government is left wing, but they're pro-American left wing. Yeah. The, the DPP, the KMT is the conservative party in Taiwan. The DPP is the left wing party. But the thing is, is that in Taiwanese politics, it's it's weird the way that domestic and foreign politics works. The conservative forces in Taiwan actually want closer relations with the mainland. The KMT actually wants closer relations with the mainland because they view them as a potential trading partner. And the KMT's logic is, well, as long as nobody goes to war with each other, why don't we just make friends with the with our mainland cousins and trade with them? And then maybe one day the CCP will collapse and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll walk in and we'll re reform China under the KMT's banner. And the DPP, they're not interested in that. The DPP wants independence. Mm -hmm. But they know that if they declare independence, that they would get invaded. And so their thought process is, well, we don't need to declare independence because we're already an independent country. We are the Republic of China. But they have no interest in reintegrating with the mainland under any circumstances. And so the DPP is a, a pro-American left-wing party. They're very socially progressive. They're somewhat economically on the left, but they're very pro-U.S. because they view the U.S. as a means to defend themselves, whereas the KMT— they're not anti-U.S., well, but no, they're— Well, the, the KMT still wants close relations with the United States. They I, yeah, know like I said, the they're not anti-U.S. Well, no, but they also both sides know that the United States military guarantees Taiwanese relative independence, right? They're not technically independent. Everyone has a one-China policy, but— um, they, they are practically independent. Yeah, I, yeah, yes, I, I agree that the KMT is not hostile to the United States. They they still support the United States. But the point is, is that I'm using this as an example because in Beijing, the way that they look at foreign policy is that they see that the secessionists in Taiwan are the same people that are pushing wokeism. And, and so and, and let's be honest. Wokeism has no place in China no. because wokeism is, and we've talked about this on this podcast with things like Besmanov's process of destabilization. Wokeism is a form of destabilization, but you don't need destabilization when you already have the Marxist regime in charge. And so China has no tolerance for things like wokeism, intersectionality. Oh, no. I, see, here's where I disagree. China has amazing tolerance for all of that in the United States. Not in their own country. Not in their own country, yeah. but in the United States as a disruptive element. They absolutely support it. You see this through TikTok. And that's why I think that they absolutely would prefer the U.S. to crumble under wokeism. I don't think they'd be coming to the right's rescue. No, they do not want the left to win. And the reason why is because if the left, if, if, if you had a civil spread? war in the United it States, it'll spread? If you, yes, if you had a civil war in the United States and the, and the wokists won the civil war quickly, or they just won it at all, they would immediately go back to exporting the revolution. So here, here's where I And China does not want the woke revolution here, being exported to their border. Here's, here's where I disagree with that. I think they would certainly attempt to, but I, I don't think you can actually, I don't think the United States become, I don't think the United States maintains global military and economic dominance under full on woke regime. I just don't see that happening. It, it's too anti-capitalist. It's too anti-private property rights. It's it's too pro-inflationary monetary policy. I, I think you would see, I mean, if they really got what they wanted, right? It, a lot of the things that prevent the, the woke side getting from what they wanted is one, you have a constitution which people still believe on to some level. And, and three, there's enough opposition at, at a state level and, and enough, con, um, you know, 
contested elections to where they can't get full, even if they get Democrat control over Congress and the presidency, there's still a Supreme Court they have to deal with. There's still, you know, pushback at the state level. It, it's problematic for them to get everything they want, not to mention that they haven't got complete ideological capture of their own party. So here's here's what I'm gonna go back to is that I don't think I, I don't think China sees it is that clear a I tend to agree that I think they they benefit from a weakened United States. And and even if the United States, even if Team Red won, right? Team Red has become more and more protectionist. Right. And and so, and again, that's something I don't agree with, right? On on a on a economic philosophy level. There there's places, there's limited places for it, but but very, very limited. Um and so I, I think China wants China wants a weakened United States that still has a certain degree of consumer power, and and I don't think that they necessarily see that with with Team Red, or or at least it's not it's not a sure thing. Team Red might get in there and be like, we're completely sanctioning China, no more. I mean, tariffs, no more trade, nothing, right? Embargoes, especially if they see it as well. You guys sided with Team. You guys did anything for Team Blue. I I, I think if I'm China, I'm using this. I am letting I am letting America eat itself. And then I'm becoming a, a regional hegemon. Like I am, I am settling scores with Taiwan, which which is difficult in and of itself. I, again, we've talked about this. The idea that oh, if the U.S. doesn't back Taiwan, Taiwan's screwed. No, Taiwan's got two million military reserves and a will to fight. And then China's got to get China's got to take its military, which is not the most logistically sound or best trained in the world. There's all kinds of corruption within the Chinese military that affects the actual quality of their equipment and their ability to actually conduct complex combined arms military operations. And now they've got to actually ship their entire military across 100 miles of open ocean in, in, a, in a sea that's not going to be very forgiving to them most months out of the year. China still takes a million casualties minimum. They're not. They're not trying trying to take Taiwan. But what they could do, the the reason why they could do it without U.S. military support is from a logistical standpoint. Taiwan is going to rely on outside support in order to maintain a war of attrition against China. And if they don't have the U.S., they're going to immediately look to South Korea and Japan. Yeah. Well, if I'm South Korea and Japan. If I'm South Korea, I'm saying, look, as long as you don't let North Korea invade South Korea, we'll stay out of this stuff with Taiwan. If I'm Japan, I'm like, I don't even really like these guys anyways. <laughs> and if you stay out of Japan, you know, we'll, we'll be a great trading partner for you because Japan's, I think, the third largest economy in the world. Um, uh, they're fourth now. India overtook them actually just a few weeks India ago. India did? India overtook Japan, yeah. Japan's in a recession right now. No, I get that, but I didn't realize that they were. Anyway, I'm okay. I want to check that. I'm yep. Gonna, okay. It's I'm, it's I'm confirmed. Gonna, I'm gonna actually the audience. Up, but... I just want the audience to know this yeah. is this is true. India has now overtaken uh, Japan, but um, I I I don't think that China would have to invade Taiwan in order to start the reintegration process if the United States is self imploding because they can simply threaten and bully. I mean, worst case scenario, they can just lob rockets at them constantly until they finally cave in. Um, and I think I think that China, on on a more macro scale, I think China would view an implosion of the United States as a vindication of their own model. Yeah, I think so. It it, it would be a, a sign that you know. Oh, there's going to be a lot of countries. Western style that. democracy has yeah. failed. Individualism has failed. Liberty has failed. Um, the way that we run things, the the centralization of power, the you know Marxist model, the CCP model. Um, and, and even some cultural aspects too. take aside the political divisions, because there's big cultural divisions between the way that Chinese society, regardless of which government's in charge, KMT, CCP, the, the Qing, yeah. it doesn't matter. Culturally, China is very different from Europe and the United States in the sense that China is a much more collectivist society and the United States in Europe, historically, Europe increasingly less so, but the United States is, is still a very individualistic society. I think that China would view an implosion of the United States as a vindication of their economic system their political system, and the way that their society and culture operates. Now, does that necessarily mean that they would want to export those models to the rest of the world by force? They would certainly want to export those models to certain countries by force, particularly countries that they view themselves as having very vested interests in, either in the form of territorial claims or spheres of influence. Taiwan being the most obvious, the Spratleys, not a country, right, but a, a geographic region, being another one. Uh, China has uh, some big issues with some of its neighbors, even fellow communist states like Vietnam. They've actually fought wars with uh, the Vietnamese back in the 70s and 80s. And they also fought wars with the Indians back in the 1960s. And so I think that, that China would still have some of those issues that they would feel more comfortable pressing 
right? But not necessarily by force of arms in every single case. They're, I don't think that the Chinese are going to be invading India, for example. No, no. They, well, they couldn't. I mean, let's face it. It's like geographically. Th this is all we've talked about this before, too. People have this problem where they will look at like the the numbers for the Chinese military and then compare it to the numbers for another military. And it's like, yeah, if you're just looking at comparing Excel spreadsheets, fine. But when you've got the Himalayas in between, right, that's that's a massive problem. And what are you going to do? You're going to go around them through what? The Hindu Kush? Oh, oh no, you're going to go around the other way through the jungles of, yeah. of Myanmar and Bangladesh? <laughs> like this is this is a logistical nightmare and, and as we've seen in in with Russia and Ukraine, we've also seen what happens. Like, I don't think anybody thought we were going to be seeing massive trench warfare again anytime soon. In but Ukraine we, of all places. Yeah, but yeah, in Ukraine, which is known for its massive tank battles, right? But we did. Why? Well, you didn't have you didn't have a sufficient overwhelming force and you didn't have air superiority. And if you don't have air superiority and you have difficult terrain, right? Ukraine isn't even difficult terrain. The border between India and China is arguably the most difficult terrain in the world, right? You're not just going to see millions of Chinese soldiers there's, just rushing into there's India. There's a natural boundary there. And I think that the Chinese, so here's the, here's the problem. A lot of people have this idea, and I understand why, but a lot of people have this idea that, that China are the comical villains. They're just comically evil. Right. The CCP is the most evil force in the world. I mean, I, I despise the CCP. There is nothing good to write home about with respect to how the CCP operates. But it's it's important to understand that they are humans. They're not cartoon villains. And and they're not the Nazis in the sense that like Nazi foreign policy was we will invade you, conquer you and exterminate you. There's mm -hmm. no there's no negotiating to be had at that point when you're dealing with with a genocidal cult that, that wants to conquer the world and establish a bunch of ubermensch. But the Chinese don't operate like that. The Chinese are nationalists, despite the fact that they're communists, and they're communists. I mean, Richard Nixon talked about this a lot, that um, Chinese leaders are operate on, under a China-first philosophy, and after that, the secondary conditions of ideology come into play. But every single leader within the CCP operates on what is best for China, geopolitically, strategically, economically, globally. And then they look, they worry about the ideology. Now, internally, they, they obviously try to apply the ideology to their own country. But at the end of the day, China has their own interests. And global domination is yeah. not something that the Chinese are necessarily looking for, in part because it's really expensive to maintain a global empire like the United States. Yeah. Part of the reason that we could even have a civil war is probably because of an implosion of the American global empire because of things like a sovereign debt crisis that you brought up at the beginning of the podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Chinese are, are looking to establish their own global empire, I think that the Chinese would be looking to reshape the global order in a way that's suitable to them. Yeah. But I, I don't I don't see the Chinese invading Singapore. No, I, I, I think I think China I think what China does is it it makes itself the the absolute uncontested geographical hegemon for that area of the world. Uh, Japan and South Korea would find themselves in a position of, of again, I, I don't think China invades South Korea or China, or excuse me, Japan necessarily, but they do, they have to realign their, their alliances in order to prevent invasion or economic sabotage or whatever it is. I, I could see China saying, we're going to end this Taiwan question once and for all, in part because Xi Jinping, I think Xi Jinping needs, thinks he needs a war for his own internal stability right right now because again they've got they've got some massive problems that he needs to distract the population from and leaders are known to use wars in order to do that and again whereas and, and let's let's talk about the whole russia connection because russia is the next country we're going to talk about but th there there has been a theory for a while now that historically china and russia have not been allies it's been more recent right now china um you know they need more fresh water and lake bacall and in, in in uh Russia is, is probably the, the best place for them to be able to get it. Um, you know, Eastern Russia and, and those parts of Siberia are, are rich in natural resources, low in population. Um, Russia right now, if, if China really wanted to go for it, the only thing Russia would be able to do to stop them is nuclear deterrence. Um, and again, China has nuclear weapons as well. So the, the real question is, is that how, how bad does either side want to do it? Would Russia be willing to make any concession, territorial concessions for area that at one point historically actually did belong to, to China? Um, and so that's where you'd be looking at questions around parts of Mongolia, parts of... Personally, I don't think that Beijing believes that trading outer Manchuria for Shenzhen is a worthwhile trade. 
And, and, and what I mean by that is is, is the, the nuclear and, question, yeah. right? Like, I mean, because outer Manchuria used to belong to China until 1860, yeah. um, which is funny because that was like the Qing homeland. Yeah. And, and the Qing had to sign it off to the Russians because they were busy fighting. Oh, and they're still historically bitter about it. Like, yeah. It's not, and, yeah. And, and, and I mean, they, they had other problems. The British and French were invading yeah. them in the Second Opium War at the time. And so yeah. and and they had a civil war going on, the bloodiest in history. And so there were a lot of problems. And Russia was able to redraw the borders in their own favor. And then you had... They came together again after the civil war in China, where they both had communist regimes, but then they split again, the famous Sino-Soviet split in the 1960s, and they even had border skirmishes in the 1960s. Yeah. This is left out of a lot of, of, of a lot of um, history books is that China and Russia did fight a, a quiet war mm -hmm. briefly in the 1960s over what at the time was a somewhat disputed border in, in Manchuria. But the thing is, is that, again, I, I don't think that China is looking at a relatively spark. I don't think Vladivostok is worth trading a, a city that would get nuked well, it, for it, them invading it would, it Russia. Would also, it would also be the question of the other natural resources that you could potentially pull out, out of that out of that region. But I, I tend to agree. I, I think when you're looking at what's going on in the world right now, I think China and Russia would probably see themselves as allies of convenience. And guardians um, of stability. Yeah, I, I think so. And I, and I and I think that there's enough. Um, again, I think if China could retake Taiwan, uh, take the Spratleys and, and essentially have every other country in that region. The, the other area where I think they would really try to exert influence and potentially run into issues with with India. Um, but I think they would really try to to. I think they would try to exert influence with respect to, you know, countries like Vietnam, countries like Laos, Cambodia. Um, and especially countries like like Indonesia or excuse me Indonesia and Myanmar because now when you're talking about the Straits of Malacca that's one of the the busiest trading you know uh, uh, seaborne trade ports in the world um, or or venues um, and and I think they would want to establish a certain degree of of dominance over, over that area which wouldn't necessarily include Chinese military bases everywhere but I I think you would see countries in that area seeing it as in their best interest to align with China. Australia would be put in a very, very difficult position. Um, New Zealand as well. They, they, yeah. they wouldn't want to pick a fight with China no. over any of these these no. areas and because instead they'd be like, well, they're the new kid, you know, the big kid on the block yeah. and nobody can stop anymore. And at the end of the day, it's not like China wants to conquer Australia. And no. So it's just simply, are, are we going to lose out and pick a fight with them that we can't win or are we just going to get rich and trade with them. They're just going to trade with them. Yeah. China would treat Southeast Asia the way that the United States historically treated Central America and the Caribbean, where it's, yeah. this is our backyard. Yes. Stay out the rest they, of the they, world. You, the Monroe Doctrine. The Chinese would have a Monroe Doctrine of their, the Xi Jinping Doctrine, which yeah. would basically mean that you, this this side of the Pacific belongs to us and, and don't screw with it. And, and without American protection, that's almost positively the direction they would... Well, yeah, because no. because keep in mind, it, it, there there have been some really really strange alliances through throughout time. Like it used to be that India was far closer to. It used to be that India, even though China was communist, it used to be that China was closer to the United States and India was closer to uh, the Soviet Union. The United States was closer to Pakistan than it was India. Now a lot of that has shifted after the fall of the Soviet Union, after the rise of of um, China, and. Um, because India has actually become more friendly to the United States over time as it's actually become less, you know, less socialist. Yeah. Less socialist. And Pakistan has become more hostile because of, you know, well, where did we kill bin Laden again? <laughs> right. Um, so I, I, but I do, I think that's, I think China would look at it as um, they would really reestablish themselves as the true middle kingdom. And, and this is their area. And like, like you said, I don't think they would be trying to pick wars that didn't make sense for them. But I think they could justify in the minds of themselves, their population and whatnot, taking back Taiwan and and reasserting their control to where, again, the, the, the argument for a lot of these countries is they don't want to invade us. They don't want to take us over. They do want trade concessions. And that's not necessarily a bad thing for us. And now a, a ton of countries, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, Australia, Singapore, Vietnam, um, Thailand. Uh, yeah, Vietnam is actually closer to the United States than it is to China, right? That That's bizarre to they people. They do not get along. It's true. But all of those countries, which are right now more closely aligned with the United States, would, would probably shift their, they would do one of two things. They would either shift their allegiance to China, or not even allegiance, but just they would be seen as the primary trading partners and the guaranteeing of the security and stability. 
or India and China would end up with this, this question of who controls what. And I think India might content itself with, okay, we've got the Indian Sea. It's named after us. We've got part of the, the Straits of Malacca. That's part of our, our influence, area of influence. And China's area of influence is, is mainly on the Pacific side. BRICS, BRICS would fall apart pretty quickly. And the yeah. reason why is because India would not be content to handing over all of Southeast Asia to a Chinese sphere of influence no. because they'd be like, no, 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 no. What's this whole, this is our backyard business. We have a larger population than you now. Our economy is growing fast. India's economy is growing faster than China's. Yeah. Um, it's it hasn't caught up yet. But it by the will, way, I looked it up. India is still behind Japan and Germany. No, I guarantee you. OK, anyway. All right. All right, chat in the comments <laughs> in the comments. I want somebody to confirm which one of us is correct, because I I know that I, I, I was actually just doing research on this recently. Oh my gosh, for a I didn't while. mean to go off on this much of a tangent. All right. In the comments, <laughs> let it, me know if I'm wrong. There we go. <laughs> or, or if I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah. You, you, everybody pick a side. Um, <laughs> anyway, the point is, is that like I, I think there'd be. There, there would be some tension between India. I mean, there already is tension between India and China, but yeah. that would only blow up because India would also be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're laying claim to all this as, as you know, your Caribbean. It would be as if, imagine a scenario where Brazil almost had the same population and economy size as the United States. Yeah. Around the turn of the, you know, 100 years ago, turn of the century, late 18, early 1900s. And then imagine a scenario where Brazil objected to a Monroe Doctrine or the U.S. Yeah. saying that the Caribbean Well, I mean, keep is, in mind, though, India's economy is nowhere near the size of China's. Either. Well, like I said, almost. Yeah. Well, no, oh, not even almost. Like, like I know that they're nowhere close. But yeah. the thing is, is that they're growing very rapidly. Sure. And, and, and China's is going to start. One, I think China's lying about their GDP numbers. And two, they're going to start to see precipitous drop in their in their GDP numbers. But and, yeah, and right so right now they're like th there would be tension there. And six times. This is size. why I don't think that, that China would be interested in starting a bunch of wars. There, there's one war that they yeah. would start. And yeah. it would be Taiwan. And I think it'd be over pretty quickly. It might take a lot of casualties, but I think it would be over fairly quickly because at the end of the day, the Chinese could simply say, look, we will lob rockets at you until you surrender. Yeah. And it's a simple. Yeah, China as could say we'll just turn you into scorched earth if that's what it takes. And 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 what they would have done at that point is it would have been a sense of national pride. It would have been a unifying component within the the Chinese people, and you know everything else, right? Uh, not to mention the fact that there would be economic gains for for you know taking Taiwan, especially if they allowed them to operate. You know, like the semiconductor factories. Yeah, and stuff like if that. they allowed them to operate a little bit like the way Hong Kong should have been allowed to operate, then yeah. then they would. That's see. the that's the problem because eventually, long term, they would it might briefly turn. Taiwan yeah. into an autonomous zone, but we we know how this story ends. We've oh, seen yeah. what happens to Hong yeah. Kong. This well, is the dark, dark side, but the point is, is that I think China would start one war, yeah. and then they they would pivot to, well, the global superpower is now imploding. Yeah. Uh, first off, this is a huge vindication of our way of doing things because the Western way of doing things leads to civil war, mm -hmm. and second off. Well, now there's a giant void that needs to be filled. Yeah. And even if China doesn't want to fill it in the sense that they want to become a global hegemonic superpower, there would. It, it, this is why I said that they're not cartoonish villains, because they would understand that there is something to be said about somebody filling a void for stability purposes. Yeah. China would feel an obligation, if anything else, not just self in, self interest. There is self interest, of course. But I think China would also feel an obligation to say, well, who's going to make sure that there's no pirates in the Malacca Straits anymore? Yeah. Or who's going to make sure that there's no global reserve currency? The Chinese would say, well, the RMB now needs to be the reserve currency because the U.S. dollar's shot. Yeah, yeah. And that's probably one of the reasons that the Civil War I, I kicks think, off. I think if, if they if they do this, if, they, yeah, if they're smart about it, they would essentially become the, the regional hegemon for the area. They would come up with some sort of some sort of agreement with India that that allowed different spheres of influence that would largely be you know, driven by mountain ranges and oceans. Um, and, and, and that, and they could probably maintain a, a pretty healthy, um, a, a pretty healthy level of stability. The, the, I, I think the spark later on would come from the amount of raw materials that China has to import. And then the question there is, is do they go into places like Afghanistan for that? Do they continue to operate in sub-Saharan Africa? If they do operate in sub-Saharan Africa, now India is in between them and, you know, some of the most important materials. Um, they could probably, and this is the other reason why, and I want to switch over to Russia now. Um, this is the other reason why I do, I agree with you. I tend to think that as much as people like to theorize about a major war between China and Russia, I think both sides actually get more out of being allies than they do enemies at this point. Because again, with the nuclear component, um, they could do in a massive amount of damage. And they've, so they've got, China's population is significantly higher than Russia's, like, you know, 10 times the population plus. 
Um, but there, there's massive amounts of, of, of territory involved. Uh, Russia has a, a great deal of natural resources that, that China really needs. Russia could be, again, China benefits more from peaceful transaction and, and alli economic alliance with Russia than it does from, from fighting with them at this point. So I, I think I think Russia essentially looks at again the the breakdown of the United States immediately means that you know the the massive amounts of U.S. military equipment and funding that's coming into Ukraine stops. Um, I, I think Russia starts preparing for their offensive because let's face it, and and it's hard to talk about Russia without also talking about the EU and NATO at the same point here. I don't think Russia necessarily expands the war into Western Europe at that point. I think they focus on consolidating. I think they focus on Ukraine, but at that point, I think they Ukraine's done. I think the calculation shifts dramatically depending on when this hypothetical scenario takes place. Yeah, let's say the war in Ukraine is still ongoing. Yeah, when this happens, hopefully not when, right? Yeah. But you get my point. Yeah, yeah. Like, if it happens, yeah, yeah. I I think at that point the the calculus from from the Kremlin is oh no there is to be no negotiating the border is now yeah. On, on the Carpathians, yeah. right? Like, you know, the, this is the new... Right, there, there will be no Ukraine. Yeah. Do, do you guys think that, that uh, who in our country, which side uh, takes control of the nukes, um, has any bearing on how Russia behaves? No, because I, I don't think... I, I can't imagine either side... So the, the Blues aren't going to use nukes because on some level, they're I think they're fundamentally against them. The Reds aren't going to use nukes because they're they're interested in in fighting the war at hand, not trying to get involved. And in you really think that the Blues they're in such a habit of dehumanizing people they disagree with that I don't think they would hesitate I, to I, nuke. I don't think they would nuke our own I don't, country I don't that they want country. to rule. No, probably not. But when I, we already said we we already said like in the scenario we talk okay. about, there's we're taking the nuke domestic nuking of each other. I, is I'm not, not a thing. talking about domestic nuking. Oh, you I'm mean saying, other country like in oh, order no, to project the, power? I don't think the blues are nuking. Well, first of all, listen. You, I think you would have to have a scenario where another country used nukes in such a way to where we'd be willing to use nukes as well. Okay. But, okay. The question isn't. Would the blues or the reds start nuking other countries? The yeah. question is, would other countries who have nukes see us as way less defended um, and and possibly use them on us? Oh, no, 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 no. they're not. Because we no. could, even if we're fighting a civil war with ourselves. Uh, if, oh, the if quickest we way could... to stop a domestic civil war <laughs> is for someone else to nuke us. Because then at that point, it's like, oh. Oh, okay. I remembered why we hated you more than we hated my neighbor, right? And and not to mention the fact that when it comes to, so they they talk about the nuclear stockpiles in places like Russia, and stuff like that. When you're talking about like ICBMs, which is intercontinental ballistic missiles, this is I push a button in the United States and Moscow goes away, right? There, there's there's really only a few countries that have that sort of of nuclear capability. Um, either through ICBMs, inter like land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, or uh, nu nuclear subs. Um, it, it, the UK has some capacity. France has some capacity. Um, Russia, China, and the United States. Russia, the China, I don't think has... China has ICBMs, but they do not have um, ICBMs that are capable. I, I believe they do not have ICBMs that are capable of hitting every part of the United States. No. I, and they also don't have a lot of them. This is, I, yeah. there, there's been some, uh, war game scenarios of a hypothetical nuclear war between the U S and China. And I mean, everybody loses because just, it's just a nuclear nu war, yeah. but we come out way better than they come right, out. Because, because the left tends to centralize all of their population in close knit, uh, big, Giant Urban metropolis, centers. you know. Well, but the other, here's the other reason. Here, I'm going to tell you right now the reason why I don't even want to get into the nuke question. Okay. Because it's boring and it sucks. <laughs> what, what happens? We all die. Right? Like, <laughs> all right, that, there we go. That was cool. Yeah. Conversation over. No, right? nobody needs to use nuke again. This is yeah. why I said that like these countries are not cartoonishly evil. Yeah. Like it's Russia like and China are not like, going to. I can't wait to nuke people. Like China's not going to. China might invade Taiwan one day. They're not going to use nuclear weapons to do so because yeah. they know where that ends. They're again, they're not cartoonishly. We are not dealing with a, a suicide cult here. Yeah, they want to just exterminate people for the sake of exterminating Chinese, them. We're Chinese only, foreign only policy dealing with the suicide cult in our own country. <laughs> Chinese and Russian foreign policy has a lot more in common with Otto von Bismarck than yeah. Adolf Hitler. Yeah. 
It, it, it really is. It's more real politique than it is this this like mythical obsession where no, you're just so, drinking say, the though, Kool-Aid. You, guys, you know, this idea that, oh, you know, things can't suddenly change to be like that again, I feel like is kind of naive. I mean, it only well, no, takes a small, it takes a catalyst to suddenly flip that switch for some people. You, okay, but, I mean, you, wait, wait a second, a wait a second. Huge, the vast majority of human history has again not been the 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 cartoon villains of I want to just wipe out this other civilization. Typically, wars for expansion or wars for conquest were were based around the the idea of resources, uh, the enriching yourself. There, there isn't a great deal of enriching yourself by nuking the places I, that I you agree, want. I agree. We're not with saying that. it couldn't happen, but again, the reason why we kind of laid out this initial criteria of like we're going to take nukes off the okay. table for like you know blue or red nuking things is because. Okay, great. Yeah, if that happens, that sucks, and we're all dead. But there's like, like conversation over. Right? right. I know. I. It's just you really do have to suspend reality to come to the conclusion that nobody is evil enough to do that at this, this point. To be fair, though, we already suspended reality when we said, "Imagine a civil war," because we've done a podcast where we talked about conditions and catalysts, yeah. and we said we haven't we haven't quite gotten there. Now we've already. Under the scenario that we're talking about, we have gotten there now. Yeah, but I understand that. No, no one, no end- one, and then I don't like the characterization of like we're suspending, we're we're being naive here. Nobody's suspending reality to say that people aren't evil or that people won't result to desperate measures or that somebody who is not necessarily e- like the United States dropped two atomic weapons on Japan. I don't think we did that because we were just inherently evil and wanted to wipe out the Japanese people. I think we did it because we looked at casualty figures, which showed a million U.S. dead taking the island and 10 million Japanese dead. And we said, okay, we're faced with a really, really bad decision. Is this one better? Right. And, and the result was, is that it was, it was a, it was a horrific thing because, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of Japanese civilians died and many more died later off of radiation sickness, increased cancer, everything else. But based off of all of our projections, you, you, the, the moral argument that is made, right? I'm not saying I'm making this argument. I'm saying the moral argument that is made. And I think that a reasonable person could look at this and say 10 million Japanese casualties down to, you know, let's say, let's go high side, right? And half a million. Okay. Was that, was that better? Not just for the United States who didn't sustain the casualties associated with, a, you know, a, a hostile invasion. So I, I, I get it, right? We're, we're saying that it, yes, it could happen, but again, I don't think it's as probable as people think for the for the reason that Christians pointed out is that this whole comically evil thing of just I'm just I just want to kill the world or I want to see it burn. I, I don't think that's quite as common. I think what's more common is, you know, again, if we're if we're talking about a Vladimir Putin, I don't think he wants to see the world burn. I think he believes in the greatness of Mother Russia. This is why I said that they the foreign policy of China and Russia and, and we're on Russia here, so, so let, let, let's talk about this. The foreign policy of Russia has far more in common with Otto von Bismarck yeah. and Adolf Hitler. I, I, I genuinely think that. Yeah. The reason why, and, and, and it's taboo to talk about this sometimes because we view them as adversarial and they're invading a sovereign country. But from Russia's standpoint, take the morality, because Bismarck would say, take the morality out of it. That's what realpolitik is, yeah. right? It's just, it's my country's self-interest dealing with other countries' self-interest and trying to find a, a, a form of common ground. And if we can't, well, as the Germans would say, war is politics by other means, yeah. right? And from Russia's standpoint, they view it as in their self-interest to invade Ukraine right now. Yeah. They, they view Ukraine as, as being, and, and we can disagree all day long, but they view Ukraine as being an integral part of Russia historically. They view Ukraine as certainly being within their sphere of influence, if not just straight up being a part of Russia. And they view it as an existential threat to Russia for an independent country that's hostile to Russia to be that close to the core part of the Russian border. Yeah. With, with some of the most fertile land that Russia has for agriculture, some of the most industrialized part of Russia being right on the border with Ukraine. And so so the reason that they've invaded Ukraine is not th- – th- this is the problem th- th- that we have from approaching this from the West. The reason that Russia invaded Ukraine is not because they're comically evil, but it's so easy for us to portray it that way because we have an, a built-in incentive to do it because there's a conflict going on right now and the United States has explicitly picked one side in that conflict. And so what do you see on places like Twitter? You see a dehumanization of the other side. Why? Because they're the other side. Yeah. You, you, you see this in every single war where you dehumanize the enemy and there's a reason for it. But 
what you lose in doing it is that you you un, you forget why the other side is fighting sometimes. Yeah. So like in World War One, for example, a lot of American propaganda was just depicting the Germans as the Hun. Yeah. There, there, there is no, there was no American propaganda telling the GI <laughs> shipping off to France that well, what happened was is that Gavrilo <laughs> Princip shot Franz Ferdinand, and then it triggered a yeah. series of events that led to the Germans invading Belgium, and then yeah. you know what I mean? Like, th- no, it was defend, you know, defend democracy, defeat the Hun. Like yeah. that's what the propaganda was. That's what we were being told. And so the American people do not know about the thousand-year history of relations between the Ukrainian and Russian people, yeah. and how. From the Russian standpoint, and I'm not saying I agree with this, yeah. right? But from the Russian standpoint, they have their own reasons for doing the stuff that they're doing that has nothing to do with the United States. Yeah. The reason that Russia is invading Ukraine is because they think it belongs to Russia and that yeah. it is in their self-interests to invade this country. Is it in Russia's self-interest to detonate a bunch of nuclear weapons over per, you know, Paris and Berlin and London? No, it is not. Yeah. It's only in their self-interest to do that if they're getting nuked in return. Yeah. And so... In a scenario where the United States is imploding from a civil war, you might see Russia be a lot more aggressive when it comes to – Russia would change the calculus. I said this earlier. Russia would change the calculus when it comes to Ukraine and says there is no negotiation. This is part of Russia, and it will take as long as it will take, but we will win eventually. Yeah. And and they're they're probably right. And they might tell the Ukrainians, you have no hope of of, of fighting on forever. Surrender – and let's let's avoid two million more casualties. I, I, I think I think what Russia does. I think I think Russia, again, without the United States involved, I think Russia definitely says their 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 goal now is the conquest of Ukraine. Ukraine now becomes part of of Russia, and that's it. You think they uh, stop there? No, I think they go into the Baltics as well. And I, I think that they integrate Belarus, which wouldn't involve a conquest. I think I think in integrating Belarus is certainly possible. I think going into the Baltics is a little bit more problematic. Uh, because I, I think you run into some major logistical issues to to pull that off. The other thing too is is that, and this is why it's hard to talk about what Russia does without also simultaneously talking about what the EU and NATO does. Because as Christian and I, as we were talking about this before, we we had a difference of opinion on, you know, what does does the EU or NATO? Um, they are they are probably the ones that are, let's say on some level, maybe the ones most likely to get involved in a in a U.S. civil war on behalf of one side or the other. But what, um, what happens to that, though? So it's not just, oh, they're going to go and get involved. It's also they just lost all of the U.S. funding for these organizations. And each of these countries lost all of the U.S. funding for all of their military well, things and well, their well, okay, economic but- stuff. I mean, just all of that. I'm looking at it going, I think I think our shockwave would affect all of these smaller countries much worse than I think we're saying. No, no, right I, I'm, now. I, I'm not saying it wanted to affect these smaller countries. Like I, I don't think we've minimized that. I think by the same token, th- these countries all existed prior, or, or almost every country we're talking about existed prior to the United States, and and so right, but without us shipping in weapons okay, and but, but money let, and things like that. Okay, but could wait a second. Russia Let's, do a lot more damage. Yes, there's no question Russia could do a lot more damage in in Ukraine. But as far as like Russia taking on the re- Let's keep something in mind here. I I think that there's been a certain degree of, you know, moral decay in Western Europe just like there has been in the United States. But but I you know and and you you certainly see the problems taking place with some of their immigration policies and what that's led to and and some of their financial policies and monetary policy, absolutely. But but Germany's economy is larger than Russia's. France's economy is larger than Russia's. The EU's economies is is, is somewhere along the lines of I think like six times what Russia's is, right? And and so this idea that Russia is just going to be able to maintain this onslaught against all of Western Europe, people adjust, right? So you're right. Right now, Germany, France, other countries within NATO, with very few exceptions, have not lived up to their end of the deal when it came to the the dedicated, I think it was 3% of GDP. 2%. 2% of GDP. Let let me finish this thought so I can answer the question. 2% of GDP. Um, their their militaries in many cases are are they they haven't operated in an effective combat environment in decades, right? They they don't have any senior command staff or 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 mid ranking officers or NCOs that have actually been involved in a war, with the exception of like the UK, right? Of, of any significance, and and now they're going to be fighting a hardened Russian army that actually 
does know what it's like to fight in a modern. So all of that gets taken into consideration, but it doesn't suddenly override the fact that they have a, like the, the Western Europe still has a lot of people. They got a lot of money and fighting over Ukraine is a lot different than fighting over my neighborhood. Who says they're going to fight? That's the question is, let, hear me if out. If Russia invaded them? Uh, maybe they wouldn't need to invade. My question is, um, won't the vacuum created by a superpower sort of crumbling and fighting within itself and no longer involving itself in everybody else's conflicts, won't that vacuum then be filled by one of the other larger countries um, to ally with? So how many of these might ally with? I don't think Germany is allying with, with, I, I think. Oh, I think that the calculate, I keep saying calculation, but like, I, I think that, that, that the way that people in some of these countries view foreign affairs would change very quickly. And the reason why is because at the end of the day, a withdrawal of the United States from Europe, because the United States props up NATO, let's yeah. be honest. I mean, yeah. it, NATO is effectively a joke without the United States, yeah. with the exception of very few exceptions, the UK, France being But the even the UK notable. has massive problems within their military right now. France also has, has big yeah. problems. Germany's military is a total joke right now they've talked about rearmament yeah. they haven't done anything so if we're not there anymore and we're not helping to prop any of this up anymore and they're not getting any foreign aid they're not getting any of our soldiers we're not deploying people anymore and they're not getting american energy this is a huge game changer because and, oh, and they, donald yeah, they, trump warned about yeah. this in 2018 and he got mocked on the floor of the un from the german delegation yeah and then the american press picked it up and was like look at how dumb donald trump yeah. is these sophisticated europeans are all smirking at him yeah well look who's smirking now yeah because the the energy costs in germany are so bad that they're going through deindustrialization right now in part because the green party lied to the german public about how dangerous their nuclear reactors were and how they needed to shut them down and now guess what germany has no energy because they've been relying on russian energy but russia's fighting a war with the country that germany's supplying weapons to and if the united states implodes because the united states has been sending uh, liquefied natural gas over to Germany in order to to provide their energy needs because Germany self-sabotaged their own yeah. energy industry. And so what happens when Team Red decides, wait a second, why on earth are we going to be shipping liquefied natural gas to our enemies? Because most likely the European Union is not going to be picking the side of Team Red. We already mm -hmm. know the ideological inclinations of the European yeah. Union, and they're not on board with conservatism. No, I, I think I think you could count on the EU and NATO to essentially, again, in, in the assumption that, you know, whatever, Team Blue is, is claiming that they legitimately won the presidency. I think the EU has no problem saying, oh, yeah, we absolutely support the, you know, do, you know, lawfully elected. And, um, but I mean, what would that equal? What would they be willing to do? Well, to so, help that, so that was that was that was part of the So. So, OK, so wording it that way, when you say, OK, how does how does Western Europe do they do they realign? Right. So because I, I anybody that's going to try to convince me that Russia can successfully engage in like military conquest of Western Europe, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't no, see I'm it. No, I'm talking about, I mean, we shuffled the deck and now it's, this is a whole different game. Here, I, I think here's what would be interesting in that dynamic. And this is something that has, if you, you really have to go back into European history uh, post US, United States becoming global hegemon. Because then you did see really strange alliances. You saw alliances between, you know, Germany and Austria, Hungary, and and you saw, you know, um, at different points France and Russia aligned, and then on the opposite side, and then the UK and and Germany aligned. And it's so the to, to Christian's point, we we have this mindset of uh, alliances, which is really kind of built around. I, I would argue probably the World Wars and the Cold War. It's built around the American-led international order. Yeah, well, yeah, but I, I, I think it's, I think it's a little bit deeper than that because there, there is some, there is some historical alliances that have taken place, but that's why I say the World Wars and the Cold War, and the Cold War is probably the one that most of us grew up in. It's this world where, of course, Western Europe is aligned with the United States. That's North Atlantic Treaty Organization, right? The, of course, that's the alliance against what we would consider the traditional Warsaw Pact countries of the old, old Soviet Union. And that's just expanded, right? It's moved further west because Germany unified and became part of the West. And then the, the Baltic states more aligned with the West and Poland more aligned with the West. Um, 
and then and then you would obviously see you know countries within um um the Balkans yeah, yeah the Balkans yeah. and whatnot but like even when Hitler so talk about comically evil okay mm-hmm. even when Hitler was marching through these various countries there were countries that were like okay we're on your side and well the reason why is and because they were I mean he they were comically evil and they were still able to get people to just so, sold so without to, even you know to your point there there obviously were countries that allied with the Axis in World War II many right I mean we, we think about Italy and Japan but there was also Hungary Romania Croatia after the invasion of that Yugoslavia. was a Soviet juxtaposed yeah I mean H- Hungary was allied with with Germany and Italy yeah right and so, Romania was Bulgaria was Finland was but you know what's interesting is that each of these countries they had their own considerations so in the case of of Hungary Hungary had a bunch of territorial disputes because Hungary was dismembered after World War One. Yeah, just like Austria. Austria Hungary was split in part, and then Hungary was dismembered. Hungary lost territory to all of its neighbors, and Hungary viewed Germany not as some some sort of ideological ally. Horthy didn't care about Nazism. Yeah. Horthy cared about the greatness of Hungary. Yeah, and Horthy wanted back the Carpathians, and he wanted back Slovakia, and he wanted parts of Yugoslavia, and he got a lot of those things. Romania was concerned about being eaten by the Russians because they had to surrender Bessarabia, and they were upset they they hated the hungarians because the hungarians coveted transylvania Mm -hmm. and they had border disputes with bulgaria and so romania and romania was a big supplier of oil to germany so romania viewed germany as an economic partner and as a strategic guarantee to their own territorial integrity and then the last one that i'll mention is finland finland was a democracy this is left out finland is the only democracy that sided with hitler yeah and the reason why was well was it because the Finns were all nazis no the reason that finland (laughs) sided with the axis was because they were at war with the soviet union It was purely an alliance of convenience and nothing more. And so the point is, is that each of these countries had their own reasons for siding with the comical villains in this case. And it wasn't because they were all on board with Nazi racial ideology. It was because of realpolitik. Right. So it's not a stretch that under new conditions, they would make new alliances. I agree with Tina on this. A withdrawal of the United States from the European continent leads to a reevaluation of strategic alignment. And there are various ones that will side with and there whatever are superpower countries. is there. And who would be the new superpower? So, there okay, are here's, countries here's in the... Europe that already have divisions within their own domestic politics over who to ally with. Two, actually three notable examples of this are Bulgaria, Moldova, and Slovakia. All three of those have, I, I, I'm just using them as an example, okay? I know, I know that they're minor countries. Well, but, and they're, and they're, they're former you know, Soviet socialist but, republics. But I mean, it's it's two two of them are part of NATO. One of them wants to join the EU, but hasn't yet, which is Moldova. And yeah. withdrawal of the United States means that all three of them, and, and and they all have divisions politically over who who to be closer with. A withdrawal of the United States. In this case, to a civil war means that all three of those countries almost certainly are like, well, I guess we're on board with the Russians. No, now. but here's okay. Here's the massive problem. I don't think you guys are taking into consideration. You've got this view of the Russians as if it's this massive global superpower. It isn't. No, I wasn't just well, asking. I, well, I was asking who would be the new superpower. Well, again, who if would you're align? if you're Germany, Germany is like again. If Germany had had any any inclination. To, to actually engage in some degree of martial prowess, they have the economic power and the industrial capacity to do it. The big question would be energy. The big question is and energy. Will. Energy and will. So th- this is where I go back to, like the, the Russians got a lot of, Putin's got a lot of will, obviously, right? And, and they've got a lot of energy and they've got a lot of resources. The problem with Russia is you're, you're still dealing with, with a, a country that has a, a lot of corruption. They have their own morale problems with, within Russia. They have their own birth rate problems, just like the rest of Western Europe and everything else. And and again, they couldn't, guys, they couldn't pull off the conquest of Ukraine, right? So now you're you're gonna you're gonna try to carry that conquest somewhere else. So well, wait wait a second. The reason why all of those countries that you mentioned before align themselves with other countries that they weren't necessarily ideologically aligned with but saw interest is because of the ability to project economic and military power. What I'm saying is, is that 
you're you're absolutely right that with the vacuum of the United States leaving, the question is is who's the next big guy on the street? The idea that Western Europe is going to think that's Russia, I disagree with. I I don't think Western Europe. I think Eastern Europe will think that. Notice how all three of the countries that I met, and they're small countries, right? Bulgaria, Slovakia, and Moldova. They're not Western European countries. No, they're, not. they're actually former Warsaw. They're either former Warsaw Pact or they were former Soviet Union in the case of Moldova. Yeah. And well, okay, Slovakia was part of Czechoslovakia. Well, it'll, but it'll still mean a lot more Warsaw for packed. the people that are close. Yes, and so yeah. for that's the countries what I meant by that are re- near. That's yeah. what I meant by a realignment of strategic interests. Some of these countries, Poland is not going to ally with Russia. No, Poland hates Russia. <laughs> yeah. Po- well, po- and I and I think your Baltic states have have major problems with Russia, but they're going to feel a lot of pressure. They're gonna feel, from and, the, Russia. and the question is going to be like because it, it, here here's the point. We, we've already talked about like the, the will and everything like that within Germany, but what creates will within a country, a large existential threat on your border, right? So this is the part where I could absolutely see, you know, countries like Germany, France, the UK, trying to come up with some sort of alliance through the EU where they reassert themselves as the sort of countries that can, that can not only project economic power, but military power out of absolute necessity. And, and the thing is, is once again, what, what happens in that realm? Well, in that realm, you have, again, you, you have a, an uneasy alliance, not alliance, but you have an uneasy you know, trading relationship, which has existed for a long time, between Russia and Germany. But then what, I think what you would also see the EU attempt to do, and this, is, this goes into our, our next level, right? The Middle East. What happens to the Middle East? Because again, if you're looking for sources of energy, the, the Middle East still represents um, a, a great deal of of you know, cheap energy because it's it's easier to pull it out of the desert than it is some of the other places around Before the globe. Before we go into the Middle East, though, can I ask one more question? Yeah. Um, mainly because um, certain areas in Europe and things like that, they have some of the same issue that we have with the woke versus, I guess you would say, more traditional. Yeah. Um, if the U.S. started having... Or, or was in the throes of a civil war. Are there any other countries that you think would have their own civil war triggered by ours? If they started That's to see question. that happen, so would they start fighting too amongst themselves? Part of the reason I ask this is because we're watching what's happening right now in Gaza, and you've got parts of our country fighting each other over, like, not actually. Well, with it's mainly like college word students. fight, word fighting, <laughs> but yeah. still, still ideologically getting really. I mean, death to America on one side, and you know, uh, shaming the anti. Uh, you know, you know, that's Semites a really good question. Side. And so, because that dynamic will exist in other countries too, where they're like, of oh, it's the worse in win. some of these countries. Yeah. Of course, you the, go to Western Europe, and there's so they hundred thousand people marches in places like London. Yeah, that, that's right. a, that's so a, that's a really good question. they would be looking at the U.S. going, well, I want these people to win. And the others would say, I want those people to win. That would start a fight within their own country. So, that, that's, a, so that's an excellent question. And, and yeah, that's a really good I, I could see, okay, here's the countries where I think that's most likely to like manifest itself and like, we'll say actual fighting. Maybe not civil war, but like definitely people fighting on the streets. Germany, uh, France, the U.K., uh, Italy, um, potentially Canada because of the closeness to the United States. Yeah. But we're going to get we're going to get to Canada. What about like the Netherlands and Denmark and the yeah ones, the ne- the Netherlands? Belgium has a big problem as well with them. A lot of these Western European. Here's the thing: a lot <laughs> of these Western European countries, Norway. if they want to do anything to combat the Russians, and I just want to clarify for the audience: I am not predicting that in an event of a U.S. civil war that the Russians are going to be steamrolled. It's not going to no. be seven days to the Rhine. No, no. Right. No. The, the the infamous Russian war plan yeah, for the yeah. Warsaw Pact against NATO. Russia doesn't need to invade anybody the the withdrawal of the united states and implosion of the united states is is synonymous with the collapse of liberalism in western europe and in europe itself and the reason why is because a lot of these countries if they want to fill the void that the u.s has has left behind let me tell you who's not going to be filling the void. The Green Party in Germany is not <laughs> going to be filling the void that left behind after they sabotaged. They're a, they're a suicidal death cult is what they are yeah. because they sabotaged their own economy and their own energy industry. And they want to disarm the German public. 
And and they want to import basically replacement level migration that has led to a a giant turmoil within German yeah. politics over things like culture and identity within the German public. And so what I mean is, is that a lot of these countries, if they want to fill the void, it is not going to be coming from the left. This is why I say that a collapse of the United States into a civil war is synonymous with the collapse of, of leftism, liberalism, wokeism, any sort of left wing politics, because a lot of these countries are going to have the exact same type of turmoil that Tina was asking about. Mm -hmm. It might not be a full scale civil war. I don't think the Germans are going to be shooting each other. No. But what I do think is, is what you're going to see is a surge, even more so than what you're currently seeing, a surge in right wing populist oh, movements, yeah. nationalist movements. That. And they're going to be like, no, 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 no. The days of the intersectional left, you know. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, they're going to see what it did to our country, and they're going to be like, "Oh crap!" I mean, yeah. we better parties deal like, with this before it gets to that. Parties point. like yeah. AFD, parties um like like Gert Wilders, who already won the last election in the Netherlands. Yeah. He's he's the right wing populist anti immigrant party. Parties like Marie Le Pen's party in France. Yeah. You might see like the Reform Party, the former Brexit party, replace the Tories, especially because the Tories are oh, self yeah, Tories imploding are right now in the UK. Yeah. And in Ireland, you have a similar issue over immigration. And, yeah. and we've talked about how there's no right wing. There's no conservative. Talk about right wing. There's no even conservative party in the Irish parliament. You will see one. Yeah. You will see the same thing yeah. in Spain. You will see something the same thing in Italy. A lot of these countries, you will see a giant swing to the right. And when I say swing to the right, I do not mean that you're going to see a return of the Nazis in Germany. What I mean, everybody has this idea that far right must be Nazism. No. 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 And even in the European tradition, far right does not guarantee Nazism. Far right can simply mean a healthy degree of nationalism and patriotism and a return yeah. to tradition and a return to maybe we need strong borders, strong cultural identity, strong military defense. What you're going to see, in fact, in some ways, you might actually, in some of these countries, you might even see a, a return to monarchism. Mm -hmm. And 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 but in the the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, you might see a, a, there's already um, undercurrents of monarchism in countries like Austria, the Czech Republic and stuff like that, where it's like a longing for, oh man, weren't things a lot better yeah. under the Habsburgs? And so like, I, I, I can, think you'll I see a see, surge yeah. of, of right-wing populism, right-wing nationalism and, and right-wing parties in a lot of these yeah. countries. And the, the leftist, woke, intersectional, furry, feminist, <laughs> all of that stuff, right? Yeah. Like th those parties are going to be utterly discredited in the event of the U this is what i mean of of the collapse of the u.s into a civil war is synonymous with the collapse well, yeah, of liberalism so and I, wokeism. I think I, yeah so i think that's i think that's a that's a great question and and how would it manifest itself over there and what what would end up happening as a result um I, again i so i think i think russia consolidates its power over area this that it sees it's traditionally within its influence i think it would probably be able to get away with that provided it stopped there um but I, I do think countries like, you know, again, Poland, Germany, Hungary, um, you know, Italy, I, I think you, you, you already see, you already see definitely more of a, a right wing movements in, in like uh, Hungary and, and Poland are excellent examples of, of right wing movements. And again, they're not like when we say right wing nationalists, the le leftists have, have essentially, you know, made that synonymous with Hitler and Mussolini. And it's like, well, no, nat nationalism just used to meant like, you know, again, preferential attitude for one's own country and one's own cultural identity. It, it wasn't necessarily expansionist in nature, right? Like Poland isn't trying to export Polishness to its, its, you know, its, its borders. It's just saying, look, we have a certain national tradition, uh, identity, um, we're a Christian and that's what we want Poland to be. And we think we have a right to, to work, to make Poland that, um, and, and that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't vote if you don't agree with those things, but they're certainly not opening themselves up to mass immigration from other, other cultures and countries which don't share those, those same values. And what, what's fascinating is the left gets always, oh, that's xenophobic. Okay, well, the, the people that are coming from these other countries, if I were to go to those countries and insist on, on you know, gay pride parades in downtown Gaza, right? Like, would, would, would Baghdad be open to that? Like, no. All of those other, it, it's amazing how the left thinks that all the people coming from other countries, that those countries have an absolute right to protect their own cultural identity and, you know, we need to avoid any sort of cultural appropriation. And, and, and in fact, when they move to the United States, they should also, there's a, assimilation is just a dog whistle for racism. It's, so it, it's amazing. That's how you know they're full of crap, right? Is because if, if we're talking about those countries, they think it's absolutely appropriate for them to protect their culture and their institutions and their traditions. 
right? And if they move outside of their country, we should equally, you know, protect those cultures and traditions. But if we want to do the same thing, we're racist. That's how you know, again, that's how you know the left is full of crap on this. But countries like Poland have been very much like, no, this is what it means. This is what it means to be in Poland. And we want to, we want to protect and defend that. Hungary as well. Hungary as well, and I think you would probably see a resurgence of that in place. Now, listen, let's also be honest, right? There, there's a we, – we've talked about this a lot. When, when you talk about patriotism, right, okay, there's, there's a positive manifestation of that. There can be a negative manifestation of that. If patriotism leads you to believe that, well, my view – on something is so important that I need to either export it through conquest or I need to violently repress anybody that disagrees with me, that could be a negative manifestation of patriotism or nationalism. If your view is, no, we have certain, we have certain traditions within, like, say, the United States that we would like to protect and preserve, um, and, and we, are, we are going to insist on protecting and preserving them, that is not a negative manifestation. Well, again, you could see the same thing in other countries where it's like, look, if you want to immigrate to Germany, we expect you to speak German. We expect you to respect the laws of, of our land and our traditions and not try to replace them with the traditions of the laws from whence you came. You, you may, again, we may be fully, um, uh, fully open to you um, expressing and experiencing your traditions and sharing your traditions with us, but they're not going to supplant our traditions. Our traditions do not have to make way to the extent that they are now excluded because it makes you feel bad. Right. Like that's not going to be a thing. And unfortunately, that, that's the sort of that would be the pon positive manifestation of countries like Germany, France, the UK, Ireland saying, look, a negative manifestation would be Germany being like Danzig is ours again. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A negative manifestation. Of these countries turn into, you know, again, do you think the Middle East has um, a similar problem on their hands or do you think that they they do not nearly have the woke problem? That no, Europe no. Has? <laughs> you think you think. Uh, I mean, because they're kind of the most extreme uh, version of dealing with those problems. I mean, well, they would so they what, will kill people in the street. Well, the, the throw middle them off buildings the, and th things like that. The Middle East would be uh, the Middle East would be a really interesting area to watch because um, Israel is is economically, you know, uh, powerful, especially for its its size and you know, way, like it hit it hits way above its weight economically. Um, militarily, it's proven several times over that it's a very, very capable military, and it's actually developed a significant amount of its own defense industry, mm -hmm. which, is, which is very impressive. But don't, don't they have a little bit of the wokeism creeping oh, in yeah, there as well? Yeah, they de they definitely have problems with that too. The difference is is that it it um, because they are constantly faced with an existential threat, there there it hasn't completely manifested in abandoning all martial prowess, right? So yeah, they'll, they'll do the gay pride parade through downtown Tel Aviv. Right, but they're not exactly telling their young men that they're they're toxic if they serve in the military. In fact, they require it. They require right. the women too. You, yeah, you you are. They have they have mandatory conscription in in Israel because again they've when, when you have a country that small surrounded by so many other countries that have been traditionally hostile to them, they have to be able to organize, mobilize, and fight very quickly. the The weakness within Israel is that ultimately it has to mobilize so much of of its economy to be able to fight its neighbors, that its economy is run to a standstill unless it has external support. And so Israel could probably fight for, I mean, again, pound for pound, the Israeli military is destroying the Syrians, the Egyptians, the Iraqis, the Saudi Arabians, like the Iranians. Like there, there is no military that pound for pound okay, is standing so up to Israel. Okay, so do you think in a situation like this that um, Israel tries to uh, expand its borders? I think what Israel does in a situation like, I mean, it depends. It depends heavily on Iran, um, because the, what what is bringing what brought Egypt to the negotiating table with Israel was in large part massive amounts of U.S. foreign aid. So Israel, I think, is the number one largest recipient of U.S. foreign aid, and Egypt is number two. And you, Ukraine's got to be up. There oh, Ukraine's not. up there now, but that's that's somewhat conditional, right? It's like Israel, and and not that it isn't conditional in Israel and Egypt, but. It's largely been sustained over decades now because the Egyptian military is actually the the more like reasonable secular element within the Egyptian um, Egyptian culture. So the Egyptian military still maintains some degree of of positive public uh, approval, and it keeps organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood and other more radical you know 
terrorist organizations at bay within Egypt. They also have a tremendous amount of political pull within Egyptian domestic politics as yeah. well. The military I mean, has staged coups in the past when yeah. they felt like that they needed to step in to prevent radicals from taking over the yeah. government. The, the Egyptian the Egyptian military has been seen as a force of stability within the country. The the diff, but what happens if all of a sudden hundreds of billions of dollars of Foreign US aid is dollars. no longer going to. I don't and, know if it's hundreds of billions every year. And we also aren't sending our troops around either. No. So we don't have our equipment. We don't have our troops. I think. So a, how does that affect the Middle East? I think you see a lot of. So you see a lot of terrorist organizations within the Middle East uh, attempt to assert themselves in order to try to get control of the government. A lot of them will receive funding from the Iranians. So the Iranians will attempt to destabilize all of the countries that they don't think um, that they see as is hostile to them, which is most of your Sunni countries. So I. I, I Iran is not Arabic, it's Persian, and it's not Sunni, it's predominantly Shia. So it's Shia Islam. Now, where's the other largest concentration of Shia Islam in the Middle East? Iraq. This is one of the big problems of the United States just completely upending the, the normal, the, or the, the order that, I shouldn't say normal, but the order that was in Iraq was that it, it inevitably created a situation where Iraq was closer to Iran, where they, where they had been historical enemies under Saddam Hussein. But... Countries like Saudi Arabia and, and Qatar and Bahrain and Jordan and Syria and Egypt saw Iraq as some, somewhat of a, of a buffer with the Iranians. Well, now the Iranians are, are heavily involved in like the Yemeni civil war, just like the Saudi Arabians are. And so what you would, what you would see in the Middle East, I think, is um, Iran would certainly up its efforts to try to, to destabilize um, regimes that they think are hostile to Iran's kind of like regional you know, desires for, for hegemony of the Islamic world. Um, and that would create a really, really interesting dynamic because I think at that point, I don't know how dedicated the house of Saud, right. Which is the, the ruling, um, family of Saudi Arabia. I don't know the Egyptian military. I don't know like the Jordanian military that I don't know how much they care about the plight of the Palestinians at that point, because keep in mind, Christian wrote a really good why minutes on this yeah, where none of them want them either, where the Palestinian refugees, right. the moment they went into Egypt and, and Jordan and Kuwait and Lebanon, they immediately destabilized those countries and started fighting against the, the current regimes. And so they all got kicked out, right? The Kuwaitis kicked out almost all of their Palestinian refugees. The the Jordanians kicked out almost all of their they By finally force of arms. Oh yeah, too. like like fighting in the streets, killing them because they had set up like, like their own militaries and political parties within these countries and were essentially fighting against those regimes. And so I, I think you you could see a situation. This would be an incredibly delicate balancing act mm -hmm. between the Israeli government the Egyptian government, the Jordanian government, and I think the Saudi government. Syria is too jacked up to play much of Lebanon a role. Lebanon as well. Lebanon <laughs> as well. Um, this would really be a question of, of, I would say, UAE, so United Arab Emirates, um, Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, um, Egypt, and Jordan. Probably coming to some sort of like quiet agreement with Israel that, look, we're not going to mess with you. You're not going to mess with us. You know, we, we all got to take care of these like destabilizing terrorist organizations, which are undermining our, our, our various rules. We know that a lot of the funding is coming from Iran. So we're all going to stay within our proper lanes. But we all agree we're not letting Iran get global hegemony of, of, of the Middle East. One thing that's interesting is and, and this kind of I'm not going to like permanently circle back, but this yeah. actually circles back to China because China was brokering relations between some of these countries and the Iranians restoring them. So, for example, I believe it was about a year ago that China worked to restore relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran. It yeah. had been broken for, for decades. Yeah. And um, China would probably pay, play a bigger role in this, in part because China has a vested interest in making sure that oil flows freely from these Arab countries through, you know, around um, you know, the Indian subcontinent through the, the uh, yeah. you know, Malacca Straits and then two Chinese ports because they need that for energy. And so China actually probably would play a very big role with working between these Arab countries, within these Arab countries and with the Israelis in order to make sure that the entire, you know, Middle East doesn't just blow itself up because that would be very bad for the Chinese. And you know what? A lot of yeah. these Middle Eastern countries, ultimately, a lot of these Middle Eastern countries might be like, there is no reason to start a, a fourth war with the Israelis over the West Bank yeah. or Gaza 
They might just say, look, as long as you don't commit genocide or, you know, yeah. everything that the college campus, you know, students in America that are now battling <laughs> in the streets of, of yeah. American cities against Team Red, as long as you don't do the stuff that they falsely accused you of actually doing, because let's be honest, Israel is not actually committing a genocide right now. No. There, there, there's a difference between attacking targets that unfortunately results in, uh, in collateral damage and doing the type of things that you actually see yeah. genocide Hitler, is taking. Hitler was not giving anybody notice before he bombed them. Yes. So they could they could leave where the, the targeted areas. But but like the point is is that a lot of these countries might go to the Israelis and be like, look, the West Bank is yours. Gaza is yours. And as long as you don't export, you know, a bunch of terrorist groups to us again and we have another Black September situation. There, 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 I just I find it very difficult to believe that the Saudi government or even the Jordanians or even the Egyptians, for that matter, would want to start a war with Israel over Gaza and the West Bank. I, 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 I have a question. Yeah. Economically, um, you know, obviously everyone says, you know, we went to war in the Middle East for for fuel purposes. So tell me economically what you think would happen if I mean, uh. I feel like it would almost be as if there's sanctions, even though it's not sanctions. It, it's just a complete withdrawal of the United States from uh, from the picture there. Yeah. Um, would we? Would Team Red or Team Blue be trying to negotiate um, deals with them in order to import some, you know, supplies or fuel or whatever uh, to their faction? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you you would probably again. They're they're still gonna. So here's and and if it wasn't the normal trade situation that yeah. we have, would it be a huge economic impact for the for the it, Middle everything East? Everything would get significantly more expensive in, in the United States. Now, I, I will say this: we we have enormous amount of domestic um, capacity with respect to oil, natural gas, all those things. That That's another thing that would be really funny. I mean, is Team you'd Red's be, making nuclear energy a thing in all of their states well, but, immediately. But, but, but nuclear energy answers one problem, it doesn't answer other problems. And so what, what would be funny is to see how quick Team Blue threw climate change out the window right. in order to try to win a war, right? Like Team Blue would be burning rubber tires and spraying aerosol cans if it meant beating Team Red, all Team, right? Team Blue would need Saudi oil. Team Red has yeah. Texas. Well, not only that, but the, the other <laughs> people, Louisiana. people, people don't understand where we get the vast majority of our imported oil. It's not from the Middle East. The United States gets, I think the majority of our imported oil comes from, used to be Mexico. Mexico used to be the northern uh, Mexican oil fields. But then again, we have a great deal of, of domestic capacity between Texas, Louisiana, um, Alaska, you know, as well as other places. I mean, some of that is not as significant as it once was, but um, it's there. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so it, it would be interesting to see how how um, which, which parts of the United States would still be you know more dependent upon Middle Eastern oil or oil from some other portion of the globe and how would that impact it? I think I think the interesting question to ask is if the Middle East thought they could get away with wiping Israel off the map, right? If they thought like okay this is our opportunity we can wipe them off the map right now, mm -hmm. I could see a scenario where they potentially try that. The question is is then who gets it? Is it does it go, well, to, then does it go back to Jordan? Does it go to Egypt? You know, like, and so now you've got even more countries at war with each other. Well, that and and so this is this is the part too. What would would puts Israel in a difficult position if the United States is completely removed from the scenario or the calculation? It is again. They have a great deal of ability, and they have they have developed an an, an amazing complex economy in, in an area that previously just was defunct, right? But it it's it is dependent upon foreign trade, and and so how does how does Israel maintain that degree of of foreign trade, or how do they get um how, how do they get an influx of military equipment in the event that they need it right away, and and that's that's an unknown question because I don't think Europe is going Europe at this point would be so concerned about its own domestic turmoil and and you know threats from Russia on some level or energy issues that it might not all be that concerned about Israel in the first place. Um, you, you don't see the same sympathy for Israel in a lot of places that you do in the United States. Um, the, the other issue that I think you would run into is, again, what, what is the benefit? Because if, if China come, if China and Russia, China and Russia both have fairly decent relationships with Iran. Like Iran is providing a lot of the drones that Russia is using right now in, in the Ukrainian war. And so if, if China basically, China's position to, to uh, Christian's point would probably be kind of negotiating a brokered like, okay, 
Iran is head of the, you know, Shia Muslim community. We all respect that. Plus, Iran isn't having to deal with U.S. sanctions anymore. Those U.S. sanctions just don't mean it, it, what they what they used to. And then China would probably work. China and Russia would probably lean on Iran to guarantee safe transit of Middle Eastern oil in in return for you know I, Iran getting more uh, you know access to foreign markets and, and things mm-hmm. like that. And, and the and the security of the Iranian regime because the Iranian regime also has domestic issues that they're they're dealing with as all well. and those are getting worse for them, not better. Um, I think, but I think on the whole, that that would it would be really interesting to see because China and Russia could potentially exert enough influence on Iran to say, do whatever you want, but you don't screw with the free flow of of oil coming out. You're not you're not shutting down the Straits of Hormuz. You're not doing any of that crap because that affects us now. I, I think the other thing that that China would probably be interested in is they would probably be interested in facilitating. Um, because you actually have a lot of natural gas and things like that in places like Kazakhstan. So you have Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan. I think you would start to see both Russia and China working out some sort of agreement with respect to spheres of influence, um, but also determining, I, I used to call it, you know, paving the Silk Road, right? If you look at the the traditional Silk Road going from uh, China into, you know, the Middle East and then into Europe, it's this idea of, of how do they maintain a line of supply, which isn't necessarily dependent upon the Malacca Straits and shipping into, you know, through India's sphere of influence. Right. Right. That would be, that would be a major coup for the Chinese and the Russians and and to some degree, the Iranians as well. If they can, if they can facilitate it, it would be, it would be a lot more expensive, right. Unless they could actually get some sort of pipeline uh, agreements. It would be, it would be significantly more expensive, but um, if they could get that, that would be that would be another reason to maintain some degree of stability within the region, and that's where you would see other powerful entities coming in to secure, to essentially secure the existing regimes, provided everyone plays nice. And th- those are the larger ones, and there's other places that are in turmoil, sort of perpetually in turmoil, uh, and now no U.S. involvement there. Do they just end up just? sort of collapsing what what happens there or, or devolving into haiti with cannibals in the streets and, and things like that i mean <laughs> like what what are, what are places are you talking about i'm just saying um since the the u.s gives aid all over the place so i'm talking about some of these smaller places that depend on u.s aid or even sending u.s troops whenever they're having uh small conflicts and things like that in order to um you want to be seeing UN peacekeepers being no <laughs> to play no I, I I definitely think you would see an, an increase in in conflict a, across the globe some of it for resources some of it for domestic reasons like you pointed out like the point you made about what would happen like a lot of these discussions are also happening in Western Europe what happens when right um well and, and I so I, I think that yeah across the globe you would definitely see a, a lot more fighting in areas where now there, there's no external influences either either providing aid to get people to stop shooting each other or providing troops to get people to stop shooting okay. each other. If neither one of those things are happening, well, then there's no, there's no incentive structure. To, they're going to they're figure that out. Now, what I will say is that in some of these cases, you're going to get perpetual civil war forever. In other cases, you might actually get certain alliances within those countries that actually reach a, a form of, of hegemony. The, the question is, is, do they then... Do they then engage in the sort of stuff that you saw with like the the um, uh, uh, Tutsis um, and the Hutus in in Rwanda and Democratic Republic of Congo, mm-hmm. where now you're talking about real genocide, not the kind that people in Colombia call everything that they disagree with. Right. Um, so, and it, that brings us back to the last region that we wanted to talk about that would be you know, and, and that is just North America. And and because Canada just, has a lot of the same problems we do, I think a little further down the woke road. Well, in uh, Canada, than we also, are even. And so, what kind of internal fighting do you think? You know, us completely devolving into civil war and having you know woke versus non woke kind of situation going on. Does Canada follow suit? I I think if any country would. Uh, yeah, I think I think Canada would actually probably have some pretty major problems. Now, Canadians kind of always like pride themselves on on being like nice and polite and and not allowing it to devolve to that level. But I, I think um, depending on who the prime minister of Canada was, I think that would have a big impact on on what Canada does. Um, I think if you had like a Justin Trudeau prime minister, I, I think you would. 
it would be really interesting to see what places like Quebec would do because Quebec is sued for independence a, a couple of times. Um, places like Alberta are fed up with um, Ottawa and other places. And, and um, I, I think you would definitely see, I think you could definitely see the, the sort of fighting that you would see in the United States spill over into Canada. I don't know if it would be as pronounced or like a total fight for control of the government. Um, I, I don't know what conditions would be necessary for that to happen in Canada. But I, I do think you would have factions within Canada that were like, yeah, we're sick of this crap. Too. I, wonder, would- I wonder if you would have uh, more sort of conservative factions in Canada um, allying with Team Red in the U.S. and and the other side as well, allying with Team Blue and sort of it spilling over and becoming everyone's war. Oh, I think there would be spillover because Canada, I mean, the longest shared border in the world is the U.S.-Canadian border. And. 50 percent of the fifty percent of the entire population of Canada, which is what about thirty eight million? Yeah, something, something like that, lives within like what like fifty miles of the U.S. I border. I mean, certainly a day's drive of the American border. I mean, it, it, the thing is, is that and and the United States is the largest trade partner with Canada as well. First off, the Canadian economy would be utterly destroyed, and in, in a situation that we're talking about here. I mean, let, let's let's not beat around the bush here, like. Canada is would be dragged down by the United States if the United States imploded the way that we're talking about. And I think that would actually almost guarantee that there would be spillover. That plus the geographic component would guarantee and the, the, the final part of the three-legged stool is is the internal divisions within Canada itself. Canada's very internally divided between conservatives and liberals. Now they have a multi-party system, right? You know, they yeah. have the the socialist, the NDP, and you have the the you know Quebec, you know, nationalist party. Or sorry, Quebecois uh, nationalist, um, and it's so so you know it's not quite the same where you have like Republicans and Democrats. It's a multi-party system, but there's something to be said about, and we saw this with the the trucker protest in 2022. There are deep divisions within Canadian society. Canadian conservatives, of all the the developed, you know, European plus the U.S. and Canada and Australia and New Zealand, not counting other countries like South Korea and Japan, which are culturally different, but of all the European descended developed countries, right? Canada is the closest to the United States in terms of history, culture, ideology within its own public. Religion. There's there's a there's a shared history of gun culture in Canada that doesn't exist in some of these Western European countries. Yeah. And Canadian gun ownership is much higher than European countries. It's much lower than the United States, but much higher than these European countries. There's ideologically a Canadian conservative is closer to an American conservative than somebody that identify than than a UK Tory member. Yeah, they're just yeah. they're just closer ideologically. Yeah, if you're a conservative from Alberta, you're probably gonna you know, feel you're right basically at, a Republican. You're gonna feel right at home with a conservative from Texas, most likely, or or, or a conservative from Montana. Yeah, and yeah. And, and so, and so do so you the, think that um, Canada would be doing the similar situation as us with the self sorting? I, I think Canada would implode, maybe not because of self sorting, because I think self sorting has already taken place. But I think Canada would implode in part. Be, it depends on who's in charge. If a Trudeau figure is in charge, he probably tries to intervene on the side of Team Blue. Yeah. If anything, peacekeeping forces, or we need to make sure that it doesn't bleed over. Yeah. And and understand too that that the the immense economic shock that would hit Canada it, it Canada would be in a depression overnight almost and I think that I mean, would I, radicalize I it, people enough that they'd be like there's no reason there's no reason for a Canadian conservative in Alberta to obey anything coming out of Ottawa when the Americans are shooting each other now if there's a Pierre figure Pierre Polyev, who we've talked about before on this podcast, he's the leader of the Conservative Party, and I, he says a lot of stuff that I actually very much agree with. Yeah. His, his economic takes, he almost comes out of the Austrian school when you listen yeah. to him. Yeah, um, very, very gifted speaker. And now, if so, and, and the polling shows that Pierre is supposed to win in a landslide right now in yeah. Canada. Now, if a Pierre figure is in charge, I think Pierre would do his best to try to steer the ship of state in a way that would keep Canada together through such a catastrophe without Canada being drawn in. There probably would still be spillover. I don't think he would necessarily be picking a side of Team Red or Team Blue. I think he would simply be trying to make sure that Canada doesn't disintegrate. Yeah. And Canada might, in fact, actually, one of the things that Canadians might try to do would be to facilitate peace talks, if anything else. I, I think I think Canada might try to do that. I, I also think, I'm, I'm not so sure, um, I mean, 
when, when we talk about a civil war, we're not talking about like the end of all life as we know it within the United States, right? People are still going to the grocery store in the midst of, of civil wars. We're a massive country and it's not like all 330 million Americans are going to mobilize and start shooting each other. The biggest problem is going to come from the fact that you look at like a state like New York, right? Well, the vast majority of the population of New York lives in one place, right? Manhattan Island, right? And Long, Long Island. Um, the rural areas of New York are, are pretty conservative, right? So it's not like, okay, New York blue column. It's no, no, no. Urban areas of New York yeah, blue column. Yeah, you're going to see strongholds. Rural, rural basically. areas, you know, uh, you know, red column. You, you'll see red strongholds and blue strongholds. Yeah, the, the difference within um, Canada is again when you have so much of their population in, in you know, uh, Ontario, Toronto, Quebec, um, you know. There's a there's a heavy degree of concentration. Um, I, I again I think someone like a Pierre. I don't think trade breaks down and all of a sudden Canada is just like launched full spread into a, a civil war. I, now I do think one of the things that Canada would actually have to start to deal with is potential, you know, immigration from the United States into Canada, um, which is not something they typically have to worry about. But I could see them having to worry about that in in significant, um, in significant numbers. Uh, because th let's face it, what do what do people on the far left say every time they don't like a presidential term? I'm moving to Canada. Well, what happens if uh, all yeah. of a sudden you know there's there's actually shooting in the streets? I I don't see a lot of the a, a lot of these people that are like you know filming themselves on Instagram going you know if you don't like me stepping on your toes get away from my effing feet my name's Tempest right and it's this uh, you know ninety pound blue haired like that gal ain't fighting on the streets to defend her Starbucks, right? She's leaving. And, and so that would be an interesting influx. And I don't know how Canada would, would deal with that. What I do think would, would be interesting is, is I think you would, you would almost solve the Southern border crisis overnight. If there was a massive that, civil that war in the United States. That was my next question, question is, do you think, uh, you know, South America, Central America continue to invade the U S no, I, I think you would. Well, because all the, you know, welfare states going away, everything's yeah. going away. Um, there's going to be less incentive, I would imagine, to to come here because yeah. there is no centralized government now to. People don't tend to flee to war zones, right? So, no, I, I don't. I think you would have you would have far fewer. Would you still have some people coming over? Sure. But I think you would have far fewer people coming over because why are you not to mention the fact that you look at places like El Salvador, El Salvador's murder rate has been like just dropped by like 90%. Do you think that the situation would flip? Do you think we'd have a bunch of people in the U.S. going back down through the southern border, especially if uh, if people came here through the southern border, do you think they're turning around and going yeah, back? I, I think you'd have a lot of people returning to, to Mexico or returning to other places. Um, not, not Maybe not quite as many as, as you would think, um, but it would, it would, it would definitely happen. I, I think, I think you would have, I think you could actually reach a point where you had um, net negative migration through the southern border, which is like impossible to think about right, right now. But again, why, why are you coming to the U S if it's engaged in a, in a, in a war Especially if, you know, you especially if you could go back um, and you have family there yeah. and you know that it's slightly more peaceful there than it is well, here. What is the benefit of coming in the United States? You you have a bunch of free stuff that you get. Right. Because mm -hmm. and, and I this is something an opportunity. I, this is something I fight with libertarians on. Right. Like, OK, so you have economic opportunity. Um, you, you have a reasonably stable country with with low crime comparatively. Um, and a massive welfare state. You have a massive welfare state. And people are like, oh, they, they don't, they don't, they're not legally qualified for welfare. Like, oh, yeah, that's right. The same person that crossed the border illegally is really concerned about breaking the law to get welfare. It's like, have you ever driven to MacArthur Park in Los Angeles? Well, if you There's just, about 47 people that will jump out in order to sell you fake documents so you can get it. But on top of that. If you just look at the, at the school systems, um, the number, even here in Culpeper, I was just speaking with somebody the other day and I said, you know, how many students are in English, English as language. a second language programs? And I, I was absolutely floored to hear upwards of almost 30% of the students are not English or, or, as a first language. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying they're all illegal immigrants, yeah. um, but a huge number of them are. And so if you suddenly don't have all of that, you know, and I mean, you're going back, 
man, it, it almost makes you wonder, like, what happens then? I don't know how many people would, cr I don't know how many people would leave. Uh, I know that far fewer people would come. Um, and, and yeah, like I said, you, you've, you've eliminated some of, cause uh, again, the majority of places that you cross over the U S border to come into are team red, right? Excuse me. It's, it's going to be Florida. It's going to be Texas. It's going to be Arizona. And then you have, you know, New Mexico and, and California, which would be more team blue, but that's even problematic because again, what, what is, what is team blue in New Mexico? Like Santa Fe. All right. What, what is, you know, in, in, California would be really interesting to see what, what happened in, in areas down there. Um, so again, I, I think it would, I think it would drastically change. The other thing that would be interesting is the nature of the relationship between like Mexico and team red versus team blue. Um, because again, one of, one of Mexico's major exports is oil. Uh, same oh, I thing thought with, you were going to say people. Same thing with like Venezuela. Like what is, you know, you know, what, how do, how do they align and how do they do business and how do they effectively uh, achieve it? And, you know, what happens with respect to the Panama Canal? We kind of mentioned that earlier with, with respect to China. But um, yeah, I, I think Canada finds themselves in a very precarious position, um, both economically and ideologically. But I think it also, I, I agree with Christian. I think it does depend significantly on who the prime minister is. And then with Mexico, again, I, th I think it'll be the first time in, in modern U.S. history where you would see net negative migration uh, across the, the southern border um, because I think you would instantly see a lot of states on, on Team Red that would say, you know, and, and again, this is what I was saying earlier um, and something I kind of fight with, you know, some of my, my libertarian friends on who I ideologically am very close to in, in many respects will say, okay, you you do have to take into account that when you can walk into any hospital and get free medical care, as long as you don't, you're willing to not pay, right? Because Intella laws require the hospitals to see you. And everything. Well, there's no more Intella, right? There's, there's no more, there's no more you get free whatever you want because the federal government says so. Um, that's not a thing anymore. And, and so if you don't have free education, if you don't have free, you know, free, free education, free healthcare, um, and the economic opportunities are not the same. And there's, there's far more like fighting and violence is taking place. Cause again, you're, you're not talking about clear borders, even though you will have people, you know, geographically self-sorted to some degree, there's still going to be, um, you know, in, in internal fighting and things like that. You just took away massive incentives for people to come to the United States. And, and so I have, I have one last question just about the United States. Um, I guess we would call them the States of America, not the United States of America <laughs> at that point, but, um, are there some states that you think it would almost be like life as usual? Like how would this affect Alaska or Hawaii? I think they would be probably the, I mean, least affected. Alaska right? would actually be the one place that would be difficult because it's conservative leaning, but it, it would be cut off from the rest of Team Red. Yeah. And it's on the Canadian border and the Russians, I mean, nobody lives in the, across the, the Bering Strait in yeah. Siberia, unlike Alaska. But, um, you know, it's also on the border with Russia. Alaska would be in a, in an awkward position because ideologically, I mean, honestly, it probably would just stay out and wait for the fighting to end and then reintegrate back into the United States. I don't think I don't think Alaska would declare independence, but no. I, I, I think Alaska would just be sitting there waiting. Yeah. Until and, and if the Canadians wanted to, maybe they could walk in. I don't I, I'm not saying that they would annex it, but I'm saying no. that like you, the, you'd oh. see you'd see increase. I think you'd see, you know, increased trade between Canada and Alaska. I think the would other we thing, see anything similar with Hawaii, Hawaii, Hawaii I think Hawaii, I think it would just sit out there in the middle of the Pacific yeah. and root team blue. Yeah, so? I mean, they, they, oh yeah, I mean, they're very far on the left, yeah. Hawaii, but Hawaii is probably not going to be sending a bunch of divisions over to, no. you know, fighting Kansas or anything like that. Like Hawaii will just some of these some of these states will sit there and wait for things to end, and it depends on how it plays out. This episode we did not talk about the details of how a civil war would yeah. play out. No, that's an entirely that wasn't, different that wasn't, topic. That wasn't the point of the episode, and, and, and so, but a lot of. The, the answers to a lot of these questions actually depends on how such a scenario plays out, right? Right. right. What, how, how what's, the spark, what's the Franz Ferdinand moment? What's the spark that, that yeah. hit, you know, lights it? And then what are the events that, that take place in the first 48 hours of the fighting, in the first week, in the first month, in the first year? How, yeah, because— How the, long does it last? This, when does it end? The oh. scenario I described, you, you would have to be at least like six months to a year into something. So a lot of things have been happening— 
during that six months. But again, to, to answer, you know, the, our, our community members questions on this one was the whole idea of how does the world react yeah. to this? And, and, and one of, one of the people would ask for this, like he was talking a lot about how, you know, Putin will talk a lot about, you know, wokeism as being a, a problem and decadence and, and the whole deal. And would, would he make that a, a cornerstone? And, and yeah, I think he, he already has, right. And, and would continue to do so. But it's like anything else when, when you're, when you're an American, you tend to see America as the center of the world. And, and there's some reason for that, because again, we are the largest economy. We do have the most powerful military and we're constantly, you know, intervening around the rest of the world. And to some degree that provides a certain kind of stability. And we can argue all day long about whether it's a net positive. And, and I think in some ways it absolutely is. I think in other ways we get involved in things that we don't properly understand from a cultural standpoint um, and, and it causes problems. Like we, we've talked about this before. I, I think the United States has to bear a, a lot of responsibility on some level with respect to the war that's currently going on between Russia and Ukraine. Because there, there was absolutely, I'm sorry, someone is going to have to explain to me why there was any reason to try to pull Ukraine into NATO. Why? It, it has always historically been associated with the Russian sphere of influence it, it's it, you go back into Russian history and Putin wasn't wrong when he was saying, like, look, if you look at the connection between Ukraine and what, what we think of as Russia, those two were the same things for hundreds of years, hundreds, right? For, for longer than the United States has been around, Ukraine and Russia were seen as, as a singular entity in, in some, in, at least in, in political terms. It was called the Kievan Rus. Yeah. So it's like, again, I don't, I have never once agreed with what Putin did. I have always maintained and still maintain that I want Ukraine to win the war. But again, this, this kind of, you know, sometimes superficial, you know, analysis that we conduct where it's like, okay, if the United States had just told Russia, look, we get it culturally, politically, historically, this has always been part of your sphere of influence. We're not trying to take an organization which was designed to oppose you and put it right on your border. We're not going to do that, right? That's we have no interest in doing so. I don't, I don't, I don't know if Russia would be in Ukraine right now. Um, but again, we're not allowed. We're not allowed to say that because it, it's we're all supposed to be like you know, no, no, no. It's just this, and they're evil, and we're good, and they're unjust, and this is just. When you are the global being, being the global hegemon also comes with a great deal of responsibility to un actually understand the operational environment before you inject yourself into it, especially when the United States has had a history of saying, yes, absolutely. Gung ho. We've decided this is right. And we're going to go do it. And then three years in, four years in, eight years in, 20 years in, we're like, yeah, this sucks. Time, time to leave. And then all of a sudden there's a mess left behind which is going to negatively impact us, negatively impact the region, ne negatively impact our allies, because we are looking at it from the outside going, well, based off of this analysis, this one single point or this one single catalyst or condition, we're, we're going to go in and, and make this area safe for right. democracy. Uh, it's it's um, sort of this American tunnel vision uh, thing where... Well, and it just... And just you know about, what it is? And it's just about sometimes, sometimes, and this would be a great thing for politicians to learn both domestically and internationally, sometimes it would just be best if you minded your own damn business. How about almost all the time it would be best? Yeah. You know, uh, the, <laughs> yeah. One, the one thing that we've talked about through this whole podcast, which I'm sure we're wrapping up here, but is is the idea of... American funding no longer being in, in so many of these countries. And it's actually kind of a nice thought that, that we wouldn't be propping up all these other countries. Now, I don't want anyone getting hurt or dying because of it. Um, but we should not be funding all these other countries. We, every single country should start at zero dollars in funding from the U.S. And then they should have to, you know, do something to prove why they should deserve anything from us well I, I think unfortunately we start with baseline budgeting in washington dc though which yeah. is how much more money can yeah. we give you than previously right. but going back to your point about the foreign policy thing because i know we're close to the end what what we have in some ways in my opinion is almost like a a kaiser wilhelm approach to foreign policy which is just my way or the highway i'm not going to think about the interests or concerns of other countries and you know, I'm just going to force brute force my interests and then 
you know, after doing that for 20 years, you sit back and you're like, why is the entire world ganging up on me? I don't know. Like, <laughs> like because like, like when Wilhelm took over, yeah. Bismarck was his chancellor and Bismarck had carefully constructed, he had spent a generation carefully constructing a, a set of a web of diplomatic relations with the rest of Europe to make sure that Germany was at the center, mm -hmm. but Germany was also a, so a source of stability, not instability. Yeah. And that Bismarck's entire alliance structure and relation structure was to make sure that another war could not break out. But then what did Wilhelm do when he got in there? He, d he utterly, first off, he fired Bismarck, yeah. and then he utterly dismantled that network of relations and how did he do it? He broke his alliance with the Russians. There used to be a triple alliance with Russia, Austria, Hungary, and, and Germany. It was a conservative, you know, monarch. Yeah. They, they had shared interests in the sense that they were preserving conservatism, European monarchism, yeah. right? And then he alienated the British by building a giant fleet. That's the one thing you shouldn't do yeah. is challenge the British. And why do you need one because as the Germans? Because A, you're probably going to lose. <laughs> and B, why? Yeah, why do you need one as the Germans? Especially because Britain was more than happy to have friendly relations with yeah. Germany and trade. Ger Britain and Germany had very close relations under Bismarck. Yeah, France a, was their traditional enemy, not Germany and at that France point. Was their tra France was the one thing that Bismarck knew. We will never be friends with them because we humiliated them and took Alsace-Lorraine. So yeah. we need to make sure that they are diplomatically isolated. And how do we do it? Well, it's easy with the British because the British and French were more mortal enemies for centuries and as long as we're friends with them they can squabble over colonies and we will be fine and trade with the english and we'll get rich off of mm -hmm. it and as we're allied with the russians and we maintain that that alliance structure built around maintaining you know the aristocratic traditional right and stability in central europe and eastern europe then the russians will be fine and as long as we prop up austria and we maintain friendly relations with italy and we make sure that they don't go at each other there's nobody that can challenge us. The yeah. French will be by themselves. There'll be peace in Europe, and we will benefit from it because we're at the top of it. Oh, or they're at the least... top of the economic. They had the had the industrial capacity. They they were the they're right there in the middle. So... And they they had the strongest army, yeah. the largest economy in Europe. They didn't have to worry about colonial squabbles because yeah. it, it, they already had some colonies, and and they didn't need any more. They actually and, managed some of them very well. And and so like. With the exception of the Namibia War, they did commit no, genocide, but yeah. in Togo, they actually managed to turn it economically viable. And, yeah. and, and so, like, no, I mean, Ger Germany was was a success yeah, under under the Bismarck yeah. system. Yeah, yeah, Namibia was the one dark place. But, yeah. but like, with the the point is, is that Germany had it right under Bismarck and under Frederick and under Wilhelm the first, and then. B Wilhelm II comes in and, and he completely destabilizes it because he doesn't think about what are these other countries going to do in response to me? It's just, it, well, it, you it, know what it is? It is? It, it's an approach where I am the only one that is an, an actor that has control over my own circumstances. These people don't even have their, they're all, you know, philosophical zombies. They don't have any consciousness NPCs. of their own. They're all NPCs and yeah. they're not going to react to any, they're just going to, they're going to do what I want. No, they're going to react in some cases violently to you because what happened? Russia became alienated, decided, well, we need a new friend now because Austria, Hungary, and Germany are our enemies because they dissolved our alliance. Guess guess who's more than happy to ally us? France. The the UK saw that Germany was building a giant fleet and they're con they're concluding, why on earth does Germany need a bunch of battle cruisers to maintain a colony in Togoland? Yeah. They do not need a bunch of battleships and battle cruisers to maintain their four colonies around the world. It's literally there's only one reason that they yeah. could want those. And if they wanted to maintain a colonial empire, they would be building cruisers, not battleships. That is a direct challenge to the security of the United Kingdom. And guess what? They decided to ally themselves with their historical mortal enemy, France, in order to deal with the fact that the Germans were challenging them at sea. And so one by one by one by one, you see, and it, this was a generational long process from the 1880s all the way to 1914. You see that Germany just alienates and isolates itself until by 1914, they only have one ally and it's Austria-Hungary. And they started at the beginning of Wilhelm's reign, with every country in Europe other than France being on friendly terms with them. The problem with American foreign policy is we have a Wilhelm, Kaiser Wilhelm approach to foreign policy where we do not think about how the rest of the world will act. We think that we are the only possible capable actors and that the entire world revolves around us and that China doesn't have its own interests. Russia doesn't have its own interests. France and the UK and Germany don't have their own interests. The Middle Eastern countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Israel have their own interests. And look, some of these countries are bad actors. Mm. China and in, in, in Iran, bad actors, 
Russia invading Ukraine, bad actor. But that doesn't mean that they're that they don't have agency. And if you ignore that they don't have agency and that they're going to do their own things, independent of your own actions, in some cases in response to your own actions, you're going to fall into the same exact type of trap that Wilhelm fell into where he thought, nobody can mess with me. I'm going to do what I want and everybody's going to take it. No, not everybody's going to take it. Yeah. Some countries might, but not all of them will. And you will make enemies in places where you don't need to be making enemies. Well, and no, I think I think that's an excellent synopsis. It, it's also this it's also this problem with the United States when you reach and, and governments have this problem. One of the reasons why the founders were against a standing army was because they were always concerned that it would either be used as a as a, a way for the central government. And, and people have this idea that they, they were all afraid that it was going to use the standing army to oppress our own citizens. And yes, that was absolutely a consideration. But what they were also worried about is the central government expanding and always looking for a use for its standing army. Because you look, you look throughout history, people have this idea that the way I gain glory and, and immortality in the history books is through conquest. And, and it can be very, very tempting for a, a political leader to think that's the way, I mean, because who do we all read about in history? Right. We, we don't, we don't know a lot about the, we don't know a lot about the really good administrators. It, I, I find it fascinating that if you look at who I think is one of the best presidents in U S history is Calvin Coolidge. But if you actually look what other people say about Calvin Coolidge, Oh, he was horrible. And they're not sure why, except that the great depression happened after he was president, and so it must be his fault somehow because Calvin Coolidge was the last president to actually leave the federal government smaller than when he found it. But we don't study that, right? We, we study, we study the, the president. And look, there are some presidents, there are some executives that serve at, at really... Winston Churchill is a good example of, of somebody that actually served in an incredibly trying time and rose to the occasion. And so it's obvious that we would study that because it, it's, it's not very interesting to study people when everything's going good, except that you might ask the question every once in a while, did things continually go good under this guy's administration or this gal's administration because they didn't decide to, to pursue glory through international conquest or, or constant military intervention? Maybe, maybe they focused more on developing the productive capacity of their nation through peaceful trade and stability and free market economics and private property rights. And, and people were wealthier and happier and peaceful and not fighting wars that, that look great on history books, but I can assure you are, are not that great in real life when you're actually having to do it. But I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's interesting to see that if the United States did, and, and one of the things I want to point out here is there's a lot of things that we talked about that I believe would be very, very detrimental for the world, for the U.S. to just suddenly disengage, right? I don't want to see China, I don't want to see the Communist Party of China become the regional hegemon of, you know, the Pacific, right? That, that is a bad thing. That is not something we want to see. We, we want to maintain the sort of, you know, trade alliances and things that we have with, with South Korea and Japan and Taiwan and the Philippines and others. But the question that we do have to ask ourselves on, on some of these other categories, there are certain things that would happen if the United States withdrew from the situation, from the world scene, that probably need to happen. They probably need to work themselves out in a way instead of the United States constantly using our own blood and treasure to prop up a particular order, which might have outlived its usefulness that we might be creating a scenario where what comes next is going to be far worse than what would have happened if it was allowed to play out within that geographical area and without the, within those cultures in a way that was more appropriate for that operational environment. So I don't want the United States to become isolationist, but I do think we should be a lot more humble in the way that we approach our foreign policy. I think if we want to see a, a world which is more friendly to the United States, it's going to see it as one that isn't constantly trying to intervene in order to tell other people the way they should live and focuses a little bit more on, on peaceful economic exchange and cultural exchange. I, I think it's, I think it's fascinating that when, when the United States was legitimately seen as a liberating power, when we are the sort of people that came and we, and look, I don't think the United States gets enough credit for some of the wonderful things that we have done militarily, which is to say we, we achieved a level of military and economic dominance post-World War II where we could have taken just about anything we wanted and said, this is ours now. And we didn't do it. Yes, we might have we might have exerted influence over certain areas in order to try to maintain stability, especially against the emergence of communism. 
But there was so much more that we could have done if we wanted to operate on a purely conquest ethic, which had dictated the way most of the world operated throughout human history, and we didn't do it. So for all the people constantly denigrating the United States, screw you. Go open up a history book and look at how bad it could have been if it had been somebody else with the same amount of military and economic power that the United States possessed in 1946 compared with the rest of the world. So no, we get credit for that. Now, there's a lot of other things that we've done that, quite frankly, have been incredibly, I, I think, destructive for regional stability in certain areas. Um, it doesn't mean that, that some of the regimes that were operating in those areas were, were wonderful and good. In many cases, they weren't. The question was, is what was going to replace it? And that is a necessary question before you get involved. Because if you don't have the staying power, then it might be better to allow people in different areas to figure it out for themselves without assuming that we've got a better answer for them. Because we might just be manipulating something in such a way to where we make it worse. Not to mention the fact that I think the American people have a right to assume that our, our, first, our attention first and foremost is going to be based on our own domestic peace and tranquility. Well, anyways... Well, this is a robust conversation. I think, I think we took it all around the world. We asked some interesting questions. I, I hope for uh, Chris and Joshua who, who asked us to, to tackle this question, I hope that we answered some of the things that you were looking for. Uh, one, one thing I, I, want to, uh, I want to end with, um, because this, this is something that I believe Joshua brought up, and it, and it is an important one. Um, I've, always been, I've always been proud of the United States' place in the world, not because I've always agreed with our foreign policy, not because I've always agreed with everything that we've decided to intervene or the way that we've done it, but I've always been proud that the United States overall stands as a force for good in the world. And I still think we have the capacity to do so. But um, I, I am embarrassed um, for my country when I think that woke ideology has become one of our primary exports and that we are taking money from Americans in order to export that. And I certainly understand why countries that don't want to have anything to do with it are frustrated that the United States would spend time, effort, money, blood, and treasure that we would steal from our own constituents in order to push an ideology that not only do a lot of other countries want nothing to do with, but many people in the United States don't want anything to do with. And yet that has become synonymous with the United States. Not individual liberty, not limited constitutional government, not the desire to protect and provide stability without engaging in conquest, but the export of what I believe is an incredibly perverse, illogical, and destructive ideology, which has nothing to do with what the United States has always historically stood for. And that's one of the, that's one of the reasons why we're having this discussion today, and it's one of the things that I think we need to ensure changes. If we're going to export American ideology, let that ideology be rooted in the belief that we think each human being has inherent worth made in the image of God and has certain unalienable rights that allow them to pursue happiness, to enjoy the benefits and blessings of liberty, and to do so with as little government interference as possible, to be able to live your life the way you would like, provided you don't infringe on the rights of others to do the same. That might be a noble export, but unfortunately it is not the primary one that we export these days. And if we don't get that under control, well, then I don't think we're going to be able to blame other countries for not wanting to be associated with us anymore. The good news is I think the vast majority of Americans are tired of it. I really do. I think they're absolutely tired of it. Unfortunately, many of our representatives are not. And as it's been commented on before, in representative government, the people get the representatives they ask for. And it's probably time to start asking for different representatives. Once again, thank you very much for joining us on this episode. Again, Chris, Joshua, and uh, all the members of our community that have asked for episodes. We hope this one answered your questions. We hope you found it worthwhile. Again, check out our community chat. If you would like an episode dedicated to your question, that is the best place to go on and make it so. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we will see you next episode.